Okay, the live stream is on. Sergeants, will you start your recordings? You see recording good. Cloud recording on the way. Backup is rolling. Okay, and Sergeant Leonardo, can you do the opening statement, please? Good morning and welcome to the New York City Council remote hearing on the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries and International Intergroup Relations. At this time, we ask that all council members and council staff turn on their video for verification purposes. To minimize disruption, please place cell phones on silent. If you wish to submit testimony for the record, you can submit your testimony via email by sending it to testimony at council.nyc.gov once again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. We thank you for your cooperation. Mr. Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. and Welcome to today's hearing. Uh, it is an oversight hearing of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries and International Intergroup Relations, which I am very proud uh, to chair. My name is Jimmy Van Bramer. And the topic today is the impact of COVID-19 on art and cultural education programming in New York City. Uh, before we get started, I wanna uh, recognize my colleagues who have joined us, council members Borelli, Jonai, and Moya. And I believe joining us uh, later today at some point in the hearing for the first time will be uh, the newest city council member, Dharma Diaz, uh, who will be joining our committee and we welcome her uh, to this uh, very important committee and topic today. So our city's arts and cultural organizations, our artists, our teaching artists um, have been really devastated, of course, by the pandemic since March. And while culture and the arts have never truly closed, uh, the data does suggest that our uh, broad uh, and incredibly important cultural sector, uh, which includes arts and education, has perhaps been the second hardest hit industry in the city after the restaurant and hospitality industry. And we've been doing uh, as much as we can to support this sector. Obviously we are thrilled with the passage of open culture last week uh, and uh, the editorial in the Daily News today in uh, support of that legislation. Uh, but we know there's a lot more to do and uh, we're certainly going to need a federal and state uh, uh, stimulus packages to uh, truly uh, make a big difference. Uh, but today we wanna narrow the focus to education and arts and education uh, specifically uh, because it's too important not to talk about arts and education. Uh, we knew that teaching artists uh, were at risk even before the pandemic. And so it's not surprising that teaching artists were laid off at disproportionately high rates uh, during the pandemic uh, with a 78% decrease in artist staffing uh, within this cohort at New York City-based organizations uh, leading up to May. And research conducted last summer also indicates that arts education organizations alone have shown uh, income losses uh, of at least uh, in the area of 20%. Uh, percent. Uh, I would also add, obviously, the Department of Education's arts and education budget uh, was slashed substantially. Many artists take teaching artist roles due to the flexible schedule uh, and additional income that these roles provide. Uh, but these positions sometimes left New Yorkers in a vulnerable, vulnerable position uh, without benefits, protections, and structure. And of course, with the pandemic, all of that has only gotten worse. Uh, cultural education matters more than ever, not just for the artists, 
uh, and educational cultural organizations. Uh, but of course, uh, it matters for the young people, uh, the students and children who uh, desperately need uh, the arts and culture in their lives, particularly right now. Uh, the bottom line is that we believe, I believe, and I think most New Yorkers believe that cultural education uh, is incredibly important to our youngest New Yorkers. And access to art uh, and cultural education yields positive outcomes on other academic subjects. When the arts and education uh, are present, uh, young people uh, have better outcomes, generally speaking. Uh, Needless to say, in this time, uh, developing skills that allow uh, a young person to process stressful situations uh, like a pandemic, like an economic crisis uh, is uh, incredibly port important. Um, young people feel the stress of this moment. Young people are also experiencing some of the trauma of this moment as much as their parents or caregivers or grandparents may be trying to shield them from as much of it as they can. Uh, they feel it too. They, they know uh, that we are going through an incredibly difficult time and it is incredibly important for them to be able to uh, let some of that go, express what they are feeling inside and not uh, keep it uh, inside. Um, art uh, and culture has the power to allow children to express themselves, share their feelings, uh, and hopefully uh, release some of that stress uh, and anxiety that they are feeling. So uh, the arts and education are more important than ever uh, because of that. And uh, and it's incredibly important that during this time of disruption uh, and anxiety, uh, even a four-year-old child uh, painting uh, a picture um, with their own hands is something that could be incredibly uh, therapeutic. Uh, dance, music, the creative arts bring joy. Um, and in these uh, very, very difficult times, that's more important than ever. So we wanna talk about art as a tool um, and the cultural organizations um, and artists um, who do this work, who want to continue to do this work, uh, but who are themselves um, uh, being pushed out of this work. Uh, this needs to be addressed. We know from the Pew Research Center uh, and other data that educational outcomes are improved when young people have art and culture in their lives. So uh, once again, uh, cutting uh, arts and education programs, decimating budgets, um, and uh, letting go of something that should be actually enhanced can only hurt children and the future of this city. So we look forward to hearing from Commissioner Casals, as always, about the administration's commitment to uh, educational cultural programming and arts and education, realizing, of course, that uh, the Department of Education uh, itself is not here, uh, but Commissioner Casals certainly can speak to uh, the department's, his department's um, efforts and, and the overall impact of uh, what we're seeing in arts and education. This year has seen uh, this horrific pandemic, um, but uh, children are resilient, um, and, but they cannot do it alone. And our city's uh, young people, children, uh, teaching artists, educational organizations, arts and ed programs, they need our help. So I look forward to the discussion uh, and how the council can as ever partner with this administration to support uh, all of the above. I wanna thank all of the folks from the community uh, 
the cultural community, arts organizations, institutions, artists, teachers who are joining us today. I know we have a robust public testimony schedule and a, a number of experts in the field. And I am very hopeful that this oversight hearing will produce uh, uh, good questions, but more importantly, good results. So I wanna thank my staff, my legislative director, Jack Bernadovitz, Chief of Staff, Matt Wallace, uh, our committee staff, Brenda McKinney, who was our counsel, Christy Dwyer, who's our policy analyst, and Alia Ali, who is our principal financial analyst on the Cultural Affairs and Libraries Committee. With that, I'm going to throw it back to uh, Brenda McKinney, our legal counsel, to go over the agenda and the process by which we'll conduct the hearing. Uh, thank everyone again and look forward to hearing from Commissioner Casales. Thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer, and good morning. Um, I'm Brenda McKinney, Counsel of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations at the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling on panelists to testify. So we will start by going over some procedures for today's hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to please remind everyone that you will be on mute until I call on you to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted by the host. Please note there is a small delay when you are unmuted and a box will pop up asking you to accept the unmute. Please listen for your name. Um, I will periodically announce who the next panelists will be, uh, usually in, in groups of four. Council member questions will be limited to five minutes. And council members, please note that this includes both questions and witnesses answers. Also, please note that today we will be allowing a second round of questions at today's hearing. For public testimony, I will call up individuals and panels. Um, apologies, again, this is with four people, not for the administration, but for public. Um, council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom, and you will be called on after everyone on that panel has completed their testimony. For public panelists, once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin speaking after the timer has started. Please note again, a box may pop up for you to click and accept that unmute. All public testimony will be limited to two minutes today. We'll be using a two minute clock. After I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. So with that, um, we will now move to the administra uh, administration um, and that testimony part of the hearing. And I will call on the following members of the administration to testify. So first we have Gonzalo Casals, Commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs, who will be delivering testimony. And he is also joined by Sheila Feinberg, Deputy Commissioner from the Department of Cultural Affairs. So I will deliver the oath to both of you at the same time. And after um, that oath, I'll call upon each of you individually to respond to the oath. If you can please raise your right hand in the video. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Casals? I do. Thank you. And Deputy Commissioner Feinberg? I do. Thank you so much. Uh, Commissioner Casals, you may begin your testimony when ready. Thank you. And thank you, Chair Van Bremer, for your words. Um, I couldn't uh, agree more with you on the importance of arts education, um, having started my career on that. Uh, Good morning, Chair Van Bremer and members of the committee. I'm Commissioner Gonzalo Casals here to testify today on behalf of the Department of Cultural Affairs regarding today's topic, the impact of COVID-19 on arts and cultural educational programming in New York City. I am joined today by Cultural Affairs Deputy Commissioner Sheila Feinberg. As you are aware, no realm of life in New York City has been untouched by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and our cultural community, which is the foundation for so much of what makes our city vibrant, healthy, and alive, has been particularly hard hit. The effects span both the profound personal 
losses and suffering that so many New Yorkers experience and the devastating financial losses experienced by our nonprofit partners. <clears throat> Back in the spring, we conducted a survey of the financial impact, which found half a billion dollars in lost revenue and thousands of layoffs and follows. One particular alarming data in point involved the impact on arts education organizations. According to the report, these groups experienced the most severe income losses, a staggering 18% of annual revenue within the first few weeks of the pandemic. Our survey also found that some of the greatest reductions to artists' employment had come from arts education organizations, which collectively reported decreases of over 2,100 artists or 78% of artists staffing during this period. Recognizing these extraordinary challenges, we're committed to working with the council to support these important organizations, which provide arts education services to so many schools, childcare sites, and families across the five boroughs. For one, we work with the city council on guidelines for cultural after-school adventures program, known as CASA. We also work with you to adjust requirements for CASA to the realities of the current moment, allowing funds to be used to serve students learning at home through remote programming. We also work with city council on guidelines for organizations delivering blended and live programming through the Anti-Gain Initiative, Art as a Catalyst for Change. This collaboration has kept public programs, public funds, ap apologies, flowing to these critical arts education programs, nearly 14 million to, a, to 170 organizations this year through CASA alone. My staff is working to process these payments as quickly as possible. Given the radically altered landscape and circumstances we're working under, there is a slight delay in processing the funds, but we anticipate issuing payments starting in January. We have also been providing arts education organizations with resources to help them make the transition to remote programming through webinar, webinar, webinars and resources posted online. I'm excited to announce that just yesterday we sent notifications to over a thousand cultural groups receiving 41, $47.1 million um, dollars in FY21 support through the Cultural Development Fund. This included more than 12 million added to, by city council at budget adoption. Nearly half of CDF grantees provide services to a K-12 audience. So this support is crucial for arts education. We thank you for this critical funding and we were able to use this money to invest in some of the cultural sector's most urgent needs, including across the board grant increases for all CDF recipients. Grant increases for more than 600 groups working in low-income neighborhoods and areas more, most affected by COVID-19. And boost for the five local art councils that will be passing along to the individual artists and smaller nonprofits. Importantly for today's topic, it also includes money specifically earmarked for arts education in two ways. First, through increased funding to 25 arts education groups and second, funding for the Arts Education Educator Emergency Relief Fund, established by the Arts and Education Roundtable early this year. As I mentioned earlier, our COVID-19 impact survey found that arts education was partic particularly hard hit by the pandemic, just at the moment when New Yorkers needed their services the most. The Arts education Educator Emergency Relief Fund initiated earlier this year with contributions from the New York Community Trust and Booth Ferry Foundation provided unrestricted grants to hundreds of arts education professionals who were hardest hit by the COVID-19 crisis. We're thrilled to be able to support the educators who are so critical to providing young people with extraordinary benefits of creative engagement. The extraordinary staff of Materials for the Arts program, which is beloved by arts educators throughout the city, has made sure the arts education services continue to benefit educators and students. The MF to the MFTA Education Center has transitioned to its in-person programs to online platforms. They continue to host field trips, in-school residencies, professional development courses, monthly public events, artists in residency, and gallery exhibitions. We also launched the MFTA Online Education Center to support teachers and students with resources during the pandemic. Thanks to the creative MFTA team, the Education Center has served over 10,000 New York City Department of Education students and over 1,000 teachers through 37 virtual field trips, 35 online residencies at over 20 schools, and nine online professional development courses for DOA teachers. 
all since the pandemic began. We have been inspired to see how cultural workers, despite the incredible stresses of recent months, have remained committed to bringing cultural programming to New Yorkers. An arts education, which has such a profound effect on youth and families, is among the most vulnerable and most important programming to support. We appreciate your partnership in supporting these essential arts ed programs and the people who make them possible. We recognize the long road ahead toward a full recovery. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this topic, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner uh, Casals, um, for your testimony. And I don't see Councilmember Diaz has joined us yet, but I will recognize uh, her when she does. Um, so, like me, you outlined the devastating uh, impacts of COVID-19 on arts and education and uh, arts educators and teaching artists and the organizations that focus on that. Um, but I did want to take a moment because uh, the city council's cultural initiatives, uh, uh, you mentioned CASA and, uh, and several others, uh, it's incredibly important to me and I think to the other council members to know that that funding uh, that we fought for and allocated even in this very difficult budget um, is being uh, used, uh, it is being spent well, um, and even if it is uh, being done remotely in many cases, uh, uh, children are seeing the benefits of CASA programming. So can you talk a little bit about um, uh, how this is happening, maybe some examples of, of CASA grants and, uh, and the extent to which um, both schools and the uh, organizations that receive CASA grants have adopted uh, in this moment to still provide invaluable uh, uh, after-school cultural programming and um, talk to us a little bit about that because, uh, as you know, uh, I fought really hard for uh, uh, years to increase successfully the CASA budget um, and, you know, I know that there's some uh, there's some questions from, from folks about, is, is this still even needed, right? Are we still even able to do this? Um, and so talk to me and answer both of those questions. Uh, is it still needed and, and are we able to do this? Uh, I don't wanna shoot the messenger, but I, I can't believe somebody could ask that question. Um, People ask that question. <laughs> I know. Um, Yes, um, I just I must warn you that um, CASA programs usually start in January. Um, so um, what we have seen is we have allowed working closely with the city council and um, changing um, the requirements. Um, we had allowed cultural organizations to receive CASA funding in FY20 and um, really have the opportunity to people to either a blended uh, model in which um, last spring they both um, did work online and in schools as we were all trying to get a, a, a hang on how to continue to work through um, the pandemic. And given the, we were given the opportunity to change the scope and change um, some of the requirements so they can continue to do the work that um, we all think is so important. Um, what we are, um, did in advance of um, the funds that uh, were announced yesterday and soon will be released is again work with the uh, city council to um, inform um, those um, recipients of the CASA program that they could do this um, online, that this doesn't have to be exclusively an after school um, program, that um, really um, use these funds to do arts education um, for both um, children um, at home through online or um, as, again as a blended um, model. Um, I'm not going to speak as a commissioner on that. I can speak as, you know, having worked in arts and culture in 20 years and mostly in education. Um, CASA program has been one of the most impactful programs that I have ever 
participated in um, allowing us to um, uh, not only bring resources from cultural organizations to um, public schools across the borders, but also connecting families with those cultural organizations. And as you said um, in your opening remarks, um, it's not only about um, arts, arts education that doesn't only help um, deal with trauma, but it helps us make sense of the changes that are happening around us. And in a year that so much change has happened, not only for um, kids, but um, also for adults, um, programs like these are more important than ever. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Gustavs. I do want to recognize Council Member uh, Dharma Diaz, who is uh, the newest member of the committee and has joined uh, the hearing uh, uh, for the first time. So welcome, uh, Council Member Diaz. Uh, to the Cultural Affairs Libraries and International Intergroup Relations Committee. Um, so yes, I just wanna say uh, in response, uh, Commissioner, that uh, CASA is always critical, uh, will always be important, uh, is always worth fighting for. And the $15 million that we secured this year is uh, incredibly important, money well spent. And, uh, and I know that schools, teachers and arts organizations are uh, and have been working to devise uh, incredibly inventive ways of providing quality arts education to students all across uh, the five boroughs. And while we still have um, the pandemic raging uh, in the city. Um, along those lines, you know, the, uh, the DOE's arts education budget received a very significant uh, reduction. I realize that you are not uh, the school's chancellor, um, but wanted to talk to you and ask you about how the Department of Cultural Affairs interfaces with uh, the DOE's program and, and how you, you see this impacting the children of the city of New York and what the Department of Cultural Affairs, if anything, can do to help uh, support arts and education uh, and mitigate the effects of what was a fairly massive reduction to the arts education budget for the DOE. So um, the, uh, the Office of Art and Special um, Programs at the DOE is one of the many uh, multiple uh, ways in which administration engages with um, um, cultural organizations and with um, public schools and through arts education. Um, there are multiple um, agencies and um, mayor's offices that are, um, you continue to um, um, harness on the power of arts and education to um, provide services to New Yorkers. In particular for the Department of Cultural Affairs, like I mentioned in my testimony, it was important to um, not only to me, but to my staff to make sure that in a moment like this, based on the results of the survey that we did in the uh, spring, to come out and support in particular um, those organizations. So in addition to the uh, cross the board uh, funding that we did for understanding that over 50% of our culture organizations, that they, over a thousand culture organizations that we fund, um, over 50% of those, they um, provide arts education to um, um, public schools. Um, we wanted to um, make sure that they were supported with them um, over the, the across the board funding um, over um, um, $4 million distributed um, across those organizations, but in particularly support um, organizations in hardest hit uh, COVID areas, and in particular organizations that are doing a lot of work in arts education. And the way that we um, did that is we divided um, um, a few, a pot of money um, for um, specific arts organizations and then it was important for us while the Department of Cultural Affairs um, grant making process is um, a little um, too complicated for an individual artist to um, go through. We wanted to make sure that um, our um, borough councils and the Arts in Education Roundtable would have enough money to regrant um, and support um, directly um, arts educators. 
And um, so the, the 25 arts education groups that received enhancements, um, could you talk a little bit about the, the process uh, and, and you know, what kind of organizations are getting additional money and what is the total uh, of that? And, uh, you know, where is that money going? Talk a little bit about all of that, because that is one of the ways in which you took some of the additional funding that we have been fighting for for years um, and were able to get into the budget. Uh, you know, we, we kept most of that this year against all odds. And so uh, while the DOE arts and education budget was slashed very significantly, um, the, the department's budget uh, and our, our cultural initiatives much, much less so but, but then how did you invest that money and, and talk a little bit about uh, what you hope to accomplish with that? How much was it? What's the process? Who's getting that funding, which is additional, right? I mean, we're talking about groups getting additional funding in this budget year, which is kind of uh, staggering, um, but, but obviously given the losses, it's, it's, uh, it's almost impossible to make up for, for what people have gone through. But, uh, how meaningful is the investment? So a, a couple of things. First, I, I just want to note that um, um, CDF funding overall um, has only seen from last year an 8% cut, which as you said, in a moment um, like this, um, it's, it's almost um, not right. And we are um, thankful to the, to the council, thankful to you and to the administration for the support um, of cultural organizations in a moment like this. Um, as you said, um, there's, um, well, there's a specific um, pot of money, as I mentioned, that goes to um, arts education. It's 26 organizations. 25 is you remove the arts education round table for that very specific program. And we're talking about three quarters of a million dollars going just specifically to those organizations. Um, Half of that goes for the regrant program directly to support um, teaching artists. And the other half has been distributed among the 25 organizations in which we looked at um, organizations that are working across the five borders. We're looking at organizations that are working across disciplines, but also organizations that are working with um, by POC communities and communities that have been hardest hit by um, COVID. That's very specific about arts education. What you need, as you um, imply in your question, um, what we need to keep in mind is that that's one of the multiple layers of funding um, that organizations are getting um, when they receive um, our grant. Um, in addition to that, again, over 600 organizations that they do arts education and are our grantees have received an across the board um, funding increase, which is um, around $4 million um, to be spread out across our grantees. And they also receive um, a total of um, $12 million um, specifically um, for um, organizations that are either located or working in COVID, what we call hardest hit COVID-19 um, areas. I also want to add, um, not necessarily specific to arts education, but um, in addition to um, in addition to um, the uh, way that we distribute the money, we try to simplify the um, the process uh, um, to um, facilitate the access to public funds to organizations. And there are three things that we are committing. Is this is the first time in the history of the um, agency that we're allowing um, small um, organizations, organizations under $250,000 to um, enter a multi-year grant. So organizations are received letters yesterday saying that they are funded for FY21. They're also gonna be funded, funded for FY22. The level in which they're gonna be funded, of course, are tied to um, the budget for FY22 for arts and culture in the city, but at least there's a, an, an there's the understanding that um, you're gonna receive funds from um, the Department of Cultural Affairs. We also, um, we are allowing organizations until um, this year, we were um, only contributing to 50% of the total 
cost of the projects, we had increased that to 75%, understanding that um, um, organizations might have a harder time to um, finding matching um, funds to um, support the project that they were um, giving the, the grant for. And then of course, um, we, which has created a lot of um, um, work for our agency, but we're happy to also allow organizations, both for FY20 and FY21, to come back to us with a change of scope um, from what their application, original application was um, um, describing as a, process, as a project to um, what they can do um, now in the midst of a pandemic. And um, just to amplify, um, Commissioner Casals, you mentioned that uh, overall there was an 8% cut to the budget, correct? Whereas um, there's an 11%, if you look at the um, adoption budget, including the $20 million that were allocated by the uh, city council, um, there's an um, almost 10% cut. Um, if you look at just the CDF line, um, budget line is only 8%. Right. And that is in contrast to uh, many uh, budget lines that received uh, 20, 30, even more uh, percent uh, reductions. Obviously, uh, I advocate for more funding for the arts uh, and fought uh, uh, incredibly hard, but that is uh, uh, a number that uh, compared to many other uh, parts of the budget was, uh, uh, was much smaller. Um, so, uh, materials for the Arts, um, you know, the department is rightfully very proud of Materials for the Arts uh, and the work that they do. Obviously, we, we've had a, a leadership change uh, there, as we've had in a number of our um, organizations and institutions. And um, uh, we just did an event last week with Materials for the Arts where they donated uh, thousands of uh, uh, toys and art supplies that had been given uh, to them. Uh, and uh, they chose PS111 uh, in my district, uh, which serves primarily Queensbridge uh, and uh, Ravenswood. Uh, and, uh, and so we were thrilled to join them uh, uh, and uh, see uh, the faces of the children. It was obviously done very carefully uh, and, uh, and very safely, but, uh, uh, but I did join um, MFTA there and the principal, Principal Jagan, who does an amazing job at PS 111 and uh, were able to, uh, uh, to talk to several of the children. Um, so uh, I just wanted to mention that because it was an incredibly uh, moving day for us, but uh, but talk to me about how MFTA is helping in this moment, uh, uh, particularly through a leadership change. And um, just got me to thinking about some of the other uh, leadership changes. How, how, how are you experiencing that? I mean, how, how are we navigating that space? Because it's an incredibly challenging time for these transitions to be taking place, obviously. And they're, they're, uh, have been uh, a number of retirements or resignations, uh, uh, changes, and uh, a number of uh, interim EDs or CEOs or artistic directors and searches going on. Uh, you know, has that affected um, us in any way? So the MFTA and then uh, sort of related sort of the, the, uh, the, the changes that are taking place, the um, the disruptions that are taking place, even at our institutions and organizations. A couple of things, um, and before we move into that question, I want to reinforce uh, something that you just said. Um, while we're extremely proud of uh, the amount of uh, funds we're distributing, um, we don't want to sound naive, and I just want to make sure that we continue to understand that um, this is only um, going to get us so far and that um, the um, damage um, that this pandemic has created um, is larger, as you said on your remarks, than um, the city itself. Um, in, com in 
combination with the city council and the administration. And in the absence of um, state and federal support, um, we're gonna be um, in very dire situation as a, as a sector in New York City. Um, moving to materials for the arts, um, I'm so happy that we were able to um, help with PS111. That's one of the many schools that we've been helping. I just wanna make sure people don't think that there's any um, bias or you know we don't have favorites. And um, I have a lot of mixed emotions about Materials for the Arts because um, it is uh, an organization that works at its best in moments of crisis. Right, and that we were able to do amazing work during the uh, pandemic, um, but mostly because um, so many um, businesses and so many um, organizations are closing sure. and are donating stuff to us. Um, so, well, it's um, really um, sad to see um, so many um, places donating stuff to us because they're running out of business. Um, we're glad that there's some a system like. Um, Matthias for the Arts to be there to take on these donations and really distribute them um, where they are needed. Um, uh, one of the uh, um, sort of uh, assumptions that I wanna defy, which is uh, for the most part um, on normal years, people think that Matthias for the Arts is just glue and glitter. Nothing wrong with that. I'm a huge fan of you know arts education and materials, and, and the Department of, of Education teachers they take a, a huge advantage of that. We have seen going through the warehouse um, um, just um, a few weeks ago, 300 trees were donated um, to the city, and not only the donation of the trees, but the delivery and the um, planting of those trees was donated um, also. And we were able to distribute the, those among cultural organizations and um, the um, parks department, just to give you an, an idea of how expansive um, the program is. Um, it has been, all the work has been done um, with not without challenge. Um, we um, have our workers come into the warehouse. We're still doing um, what we call curbside pickup um, just for the safety of those that are trying to come and, and get um, donations from Matthias for the Arts, but also our staff. And then the transitions that you're mentioning, um, I, uh, we, um, our um, fearless leader of Matthias for the Arts, Harriet Tab, um, has retired after um, over 20 years um, working at the, um, at the um, agency. And um, in the meantime, um, our deputy um, director has taken the reins and really has make uh, happen, um, really make um, happen um, all these um, donations that in, in any other situation would have been hard to um, take because of COVID. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Gonzalo. And uh, a little bit lighter, I thought when you said that many people think of uh, MFTA as Glitter. I thought you were going to say you're a big fan of glitter um, uh, because I know I, I am. Surprised. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I assume so. As uh, <laughs> one queer man to another, we can we can share our love of glitter um, anytime. Uh, I do want to recognize. I see uh, majority leader come. I'm oh, sorry. Before I do that, Gonzalo. On um, that note, Chair, also we receive over 60 um, sewing machines that we were able to also um, distribute um, around um, different cultural organizations and individuals. So um, I don't know how to sew, but um, anything can be fixed with glitter. <laughs> uh, I don't know how to sew either, but um, they will be used. Uh, I do want to recognize um, uh, as someone who I believe is also a fan of glitter, Majority Leader uh, Lori Cumbo. Uh, has joined us and uh, uh, thank her <laughs> for all things love of the arts and arts and education. Obviously, as a mother of a young child, I'm sure uh, incredibly important to her as well. Um, so uh, I want, I know we have a lot of folks uh, from the public who want to testify. Uh, want to ask if any of my colleagues have any questions for uh, Commissioner Castells in the arts and education realm and take a moment to uh, see if we have uh, any folks. Brenda? 
Um, thank you, Chair. We do not have any council member questions at this time. If council members have questions, if you can use the uh, raise hand function in Zoom, please. We are not seeing any questions, Chair. Okay. Um, uh, so I, th I think um, uh, uh, Commissioner Casals, um, in the interest of, of time and not making uh, all of our uh, fantastic uh, artists and arts organizations and, and our uh, advocates uh, wait any longer to share uh, their experiences and thoughts um, on this. You are um, uh, free to go, but I want to uh, thank you for uh, your efforts uh, and the agency's efforts um, and say that I know that we we all need to do more. Uh, there is uh, an unquenchable thirst and need for uh, arts in uh, education and uh, young people desperately need uh, to experience the arts. And, you know, I think that uh, open culture uh, is, uh, is getting a, a really good response. And, 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 and that's really important because I think it, isn't just about the bill, which I think is really meaningful, but it's also about an acknowledgement increasingly across the city that, uh, that not enough people talk about arts and culture within uh, the public policy realm and within these uh, uh, government and, and elected official spaces. And, uh, and uh, hopefully that is changing and happening now. Thank you. And, and Chairman Bremer, I thank you for your leadership and your partnership, and I look forward to continue to work together. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Casals. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to our Council, Brenda McKinney, who I think will call the first panel. Thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer. Um, and before we call the first panel, I'm just going to go back to um, a few housekeeping matters. Um, so now that we have concluded the administration's portion, uh, testimony portion of this hearing, we will turn to public testimony. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that individuals will be called up in panels, so multiple people at one time. For members of the public, Please note that I will be calling you up um, by name individually. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function, again, as with the administration testimony um, in Zoom, and you will be called up after everyone um, on that panel is called up. Uh, for panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you um, once again, and the Sergeant at Arms will give you a go ahead to begin after setting the timer. Please note a box might pop up and you might have to accept that unmute. There is a small delay. All testimony will be limited to two minutes. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. Um, so with this, we will start with the first panel and those present. Okay, just one, one moment, please. All right, so we will call the first panel, which is four members, starting with Richard, you know, uh, please uh, forgive any pronunciation as always. You know, um, Hosa from Queens Theater, followed by Zoraida De Jesus, followed by Courtney Bodie from the New Victory Theater, followed by Trisha Patrick. So the first person to testify will be Richard Hinojosa. Again, please um, excuse pronunciation. You may begin when the sergeant starts the clock and gives this- Starting gives time. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Chair Van Bramer, the members of this committee, uh, and the entire New York City Council and the Department of Cultural Affairs for your continued support throughout this crisis of cultural institutions' efforts to bring arts and culture and arts education to our communities. Thank you. And we greatly appreciate your recognition of the positive impact that cultural institutions can have on our communities. You know, even in times of loss and isolation and economic strife, culture never closed. Uh, Queen's Theater is a member of the city's cultural institutions group, and throughout the COVID-19 crisis, the CIGs have been committed to contributing to the city and to New Yorkers by supporting public life and public health and public service. 
Um, now, you know, when the, when the schools closed back in March, Queen's Theater, we had already started our CASA programs. And I know the CASA programs were mentioned on this uh, previously. Now, we, we immediately jumped into action and we developed a plan uh, to adjust the curriculum to online programs. Um, now, although Queen Cedar had taken a huge budget loss at the time of closure, you know, the dedicated initiative funding enabled us to move forward and redesign the CASA programs. Now, we started with uh, professional development workshops, PD workshops, uh, to help our staff of teaching artists adapt to online teaching. We came up with some great methods. Uh, we followed that with a PD workshop that we offered to Queen's Public School teachers, and we advised them on how they can integrate applied theater techniques into their own online teaching. Uh, now, our CASA students during this time also developed an original play with songs over a couple of months, and we culminated that program in public viewings of their performance. Uh, now, we took the lessons that we learned through our CASA programs, and we opened up all that into our education programs to the public. We started with a series of videos in four different languages, uh, demonstrating fun theater activities that the whole families could do at home. You know, people are stuck at home, so families could do these activities together. Queen's Theater also offered family improv workshops, a musical theater summer camp, and we also did online meetups and classes for senior citizens. Some of our most vulnerable and isolated citizens are senior citizens now. All these programs were offered completely free of charge. I'm now, expired. A program in a District 75 school, and thanks to uh, Mr. Moya and Mr. Moya's district, and we're starting two others in January. Now, our experience with remote, remote programming has expanded our toolkit, and we are looking forward to once again offering CASA programs, and we're confident that we have multiple ways to deliver them successfully. Now, now more than ever, our children are missing their friends and their teachers and their classroom spaces. We, we really must consider how we can make their school days playful, free, and collaborative using the arts. Um, your continued support of arts education and culture will go a long way to healing our communities, and, and we are here as your partners. So we really appreciate your con continued commitment and engagement, and we thank you for this opportunity to share how Queen Cedar has been adapting during these challenging times. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we will now move to the next panelist, which is Zoraida De Jesus. So, starting time. Yes, can you all hear me? We can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Yes, hello. Thank you, Chairman Van Bramer and members of the Cultural Affairs Committee. My name is Zoraida De Jesus, and I am a participant in the Wildlife Conservation Society's Virtual Discovery Guide Program. WCS is a member of the city's cultural institutions group. Like many other cultural organizations, WCS was directed in mid-March by the city and state to close all of our parks, which include the Bronx Zoo, New York Aquarium, Central Park Zoo, Prospect Park Zoo, and Queen Zoo because of the COVID-19 epidemic pandemic. It has also meant that in-person internship and volunteer positions needed to quickly adapt to the new virtual world. Throughout the COVID-19 crisis, WCS and CIGs have been committed to contributing to the city and working hand-in-hand -hand in supporting New Yorkers as it relates to public life, public health, and public service. These last nine months have been incredibly stressful and challenging with our world turned upside down. As we are facing the uncertainty of what the city will look like in the future and the social inequities that many of us are being exposed to, the programs being offered, like the Discovery Guide program, remain essential and relevant to nurturing and fostering leaders for generations to come. While our physical parks have been closed, culture never closed its offerings. Being a part of this program has provided a feeling of security and belonging in time where most everything else has not felt safe or consistent. I have made many good friends, laughed a lot, and found ways to channel my creativity and passion into teaching and inspiring others. If I weren't a part of this program, I'm honestly not sure what else I would have done this summer. I just feel so lucky to have had something safe and meaningful to do. It is my hope that more youth in New York City can have similar opportunities. Recognizing the emerging challenges we were facing as youth in New York City, WCS quickly developed a response that included free counseling services, weekly video chats, and office hours with counselors. Additionally, WCS has shifted its newsletters sent to 3,000 youth to include information about parks and closure, online events, and activities to further engage them, and COVID-19 information and resources related to our mental and physical health. The youth who received this information all formally either volunteered, worked, or interned at WCS. Lastly, in response to feedback from youth about in-person programming, WCS pivoted all of our volunteer internship and skills training programs to virtual platforms, ensuring that safety is prioritized while continuing to provide reaching opportunities to youth. We also had a large virtual discovery guide program over the summer and as well as is now having it over the fall, which I participate in. We also had many skill building workshops and career webinars that many of our youth and staff attended during the summer. We thank you for this opportunity to testify today and for your leadership on behalf of the city of New York, 
New York during this crisis. Thank you, Zoraida. And um, you're a student in high school currently? I'm actually currently going to reattend college in the spring. Oh, wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Uh, you, you just represented WCS incredibly well. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, um, Chair. And Courtney Bodie is the next witness. Starting time. Okay, we just have a technical difficulty, one moment. Uh, Courtney J. Bodie from the New Victory Theater. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now, thank you. My name is Courtney J. Body, Vice President, Education and School Engagement at the New 42 New Victory Theater, where we are committed to performing arts, being a part of everyone's life from the earliest years on. In the regular season, the New Victory partners with more than 200 New York City schools, social service agencies, the partner institutions to engage and inspire 40,000 students in grades pre-K through 12 with live international productions on our stage. Since March 16, 2020, the New York Victory provided weekly virtual content for educators and parents to engage in the performing arts for the rest of the school year. And in this school year, the New Victory Education Program has transformed to be completely virtual and is built to be as flexible as possible for any learning model. The performing arts are an incredible tool for offering young people agency while sparking joy in their learning. They are critical to social emotional development of young people and the performing arts help children process and understand, express and empathize. But the city is facing extraordinarily difficult budget choices and uh, which have led to a drastic cut in arts education funding. We heard from our longtime partner schools that they want and need the New Victory Education Partner uh, Program in their schools this year, but for the first time ever, they simply couldn't afford the very modest cost. For this reason, and despite the organization's significant loss of revenue, U42 has made the New Victory Education Programs completely free for New York City public schools this year. We know from our own research that participating in the performing arts imbues young people with hope and the ability to envision a brighter future and what could be more important right now. The New York City Council has a crucial role in working toward equity for all New Yorkers and the cultural arts sectors are your partners in this responsibility. We will work with you and work with us to serve all New York City students who deserve everything we can provide. Thank you so much to the New York City Council Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations for your support, providing uh, time and space for these testimonies on this incredibly important topic. Thank you so much. That concludes this panel. Um, Chair Van, oh, excuse me. We have one more panelist, I apologize. Trisha Patrick. Starting time. Uh, it, it might just, yes. If you, uh, I think you were remuted. If you can just, yep, you should be unmuted. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone on the New York City uh, Council Committee on Cultural Affairs. My name is Trisha Patrick with MCC Theater. When the pandemic first struck and the doors of our theaters closed, and after telling casts of several productions that they will no longer take the stage, after telling our students that um, in our after school program that we would no longer be able to gather in person, that there would no longer be any high fives or hugs after their online performances, we asked ourselves, what is our role? as a theater company during these times. What are we doing here? Our youth company was in the midst of preparing for their yearly stage production consisting of original pieces that they write themselves that we weave together in one cohesive show. The theme of this uh, past spring production was truth and for many of them, the process was challenging, cathartic, revelatory and a 100% reflection on themselves, their families, our society and country as a whole. But there was a mutiny in progress. Uh, those who had uh, participated in this uh, process before um, were challenged by the fact that they would no longer take a stage. We had discussions, we cheerleaded them, we championed them. Um, but in one impassioned plea during a Zoom class, one of our students proved herself in the entire mutiny wrong. Everyone there felt the power of uh, her words and everyone understood their perspective that she was trying to share and why it was important to her. 
the paradigm shifted because we all realize in this moment that the medium through which we tell stories is important, but even more important is that she could tell her stories, that her voice could be heard, and that she provided uh, the vehicle, the space in which she and they could express themselves. The power of telling a story through whatever medium we can. Over the summer, MCC also held um, meetings for our current students as well as our alumni in order to provide a, a forum through which we could discuss the social justice movements that were taking the streets and the racial uprisings that were taking place all across our Time country. expired. Thank you. Fast forward to this fall, MCC and a coalition of other uh, arts organizations galvanized in order to provide a virtual after school program fair. We wanted to ask ourselves or we challenge ourselves with creating a platform through which students from all across the city could locate and connect with an after school program. There is still a need for these students to connect with after school programs. The need is so, so rich um, that our program is as full or almost as full as it was in the past. And our teachers continue to echo that the, their attendance is up and the engagement is up when our teachers are in the classroom. Thank you so much for, for providing this uh, forum and for providing the, for a way for us to connect um, in discussing these programs. Thank you. Um, that was incredibly powerful testimony uh about the uh, absolute necessity for uh, arts education and uh, after school programming but uh, also the ability to adapt and and meet that need um because uh, we all know that young people so desperately uh, need that and um it's uh <clears throat> it's good to hear from uh all of you, uh, uh, Courtney, as well, um, at New Victory, who now I don't see on my screen, but uh, I think uh, hopefully uh, hears me. Um, and uh, there you are, now I see you. Um, uh, and uh, uh, Richard uh, uh, and, and Zoraida, um, who I must say has the coolest headset of any headset I've seen in the thousands of Zoom hours that I have logged in the last nine months. Uh, uh, but also incredibly uh, powerful testimony, Zoraida, um, on behalf of uh, uh, the institution. And, uh, you know, I just want to, uh, you know, just say again, thank all of you because the culture never closed. Um, but, but uh, uh, you know, the arts and education efforts that are going on, even virtual, uh, and what is able to go on in person uh, is, uh, is so incredibly important, but it's also important to let people know that it's happening because a, a lot of people are under the false impression that this work has stopped, that it is not happening. Uh, and, uh, and so therefore, if it's not happening, it doesn't need to be funded. It doesn't need to be supported, right? We can we can shift this money into other places and other spaces, but we are here to, and you are here to let uh, the council and the world know that in fact, this work is happening um, and it's incredibly valuable and it's more important than ever to fund it. Um, so uh, with that, I just wanna say thank you to all of you for, um, for what you're doing and uh, what you continue to do for young people in our city. Um, so thank you. With that, I'll throw it back to the council. Thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer. Um, we will just check for other council member questions before we move to the next yep. panel. Um, and if council members have questions, just a reminder to please raise your hand in Zoom. We are not seeing any questions. So we will move to the next panel. Um, so again, we will be calling up a panel of four and um, council members, if you have questions, uh, please save them for the end of the panel, but we'll call up all four names now and then individuals one by one. So the next panel will be Toya Lillard, Juan Carlos Solanas from the Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning, Puyan Taglianetti from Snug Harbor, Harbor and Angel Hernandez from the New York Botanical Garden.
So the next witness will be Toya Lillard. You may begin once the sergeant calls the clock. Starting time. Good morning, my name is Toya Lillard and I am proud to be the executive director of Vibe Theater Experience. I am speaking to you from Brooklyn, New York where Vibe is located on the unceded land of the Lenape people. Vibe is uh, an organization that centers the narratives, lived experiences and genius art of black girls, young women and gender expansive youth uh, in New York City and now uh, beyond. Uh, before COVID-19, we know that black girls were facing school pushout, uh, were facing adultification bias, and were facing uh, a host of other issues that created barriers to their advancement and fulfillment. Uh, as was noted in the October 2020 New York Times article, Black girls are now seen as the most at-risk group in the United States. In New York City, Black girls in elementary and middle school were about 11 times more likely to be suspended than their white peers in 2017, according to a report from the Education Trust of New York, a research and advocacy group. Since COVID-19, we have not seen an end to the discriminatory disciplinary practices that impact the lives of Black girls and young women. This adds to the aforementioned disruption and anxiety that all children are facing due to COVID-19. At Vibe, a theater company, uh, we endeavor to provide a sanctuary for Black girls and young women who have been pushed out of school and who do, who do not find their homes a safe space for them to express themselves fully. The cancellation of the summer youth employment program, for example, was devastating for our girls who relied on that income to help their families. So pivoting for our organization has meant a lot. It has meant that uh, we have gone beyond the page or the stage to offer paid stipends to all participants, mental health services to our staff and our participants, community care offerings like yoga and movement. Time um, to supplement um, the offerings that we have. And so we are um, asking for uh, support and attention to be given to organizations that are meeting the needs of their communities beyond the page, the stage, and how the arts can help facilitate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, the next witness will be Juan Carlos Salinas from JCAL. Hello everyone, council members. My name is Juan Carlos Salinas. I'm the Director of Education at Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning, part of the city's 34 member cultural institutions group. Throughout COVID-19, JCAL has demonstrated its unwavering commitment to our city through three pillars of support. Support for public life, public health, and public service. This hearing is to, eliminate, uh, to illuminate COVID-19's impact on art and cultural educational programming in our city. Here, I could simply tell a tragic tale that the emergence of a deepening of the global pandemic has been devastating to our nearly 50 year old institution. Certainly it hasn't been easy. Our pioneering school of the arts, the award-winning cornerstone of our mission can't operate quite as it did before with dozens of classes serving hundreds of young people all year long. But from the moment COVID-19 entered our vocabulary, JCAL never once blinked. Within hours of the shutdown, we paid our small army of teaching artists to develop and deliver arts-focused, high-quality online pop-up classes that were free for everyone and market specifically to students across Queens. Then, with our new senior leadership at JCAL starting this last July, we rolled out a comprehensive community-first, digital-first season of program. For example, our Southeast Queens Jam Fest featured seven bands for a three-hour socially distanced concert on the lawn of the Jamaica Performing Arts Center. Our census work funded by the grant from the New York Community Trust was linked to five more outdoor events, all with arts education themes. Our Thursday night jazz series, generally supported by former council member, now Queensborough President Donovan Richards, as well as the full Queens delegation to the city council has been live streamed monthly from JCAL to its social media platforms, attracting 100 people per live concert and thousands of views and playback. Our 11th annual Making Moves Dance Festival, funded partly by the New York State Council on the Arts and the National Endowment for the Arts and private sources, was proudly fully online. 11 dance companies total, each garnering hundreds of audience members. JCAL launched a virtual book club in Southeast Queens that attracted dozens of signups and will return again. And there's more. 
Despite COVID-19 hitting JCAL very hard financially, it will not ever stop our institution from finding, fulfilling, and amplifying its mission. We can only hope that council members continue to support our crucial, critical, high energy institution like ours in the future. Thank you, council members. Thank you so much. The, the next witness will be Puyan Taglianetti. Um, and again, please excuse any pronunciation errors uh, from Snug Harbor. Thank you. Starting time. Good day, Speaker Johnson, Chairperson Van Bremer, and members of the committee. My name is Puyan Taglianetti, and I'm the Visitor Services and Education Coordinator at Snug Harbor Cultural Center and Botanical Garden. I will testify to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the Cultural Institutions Group, the CIGs, and on Snug Harbor's programs and services. Snug Harbor is a proud member of the CIGs, a coalition of 34 cultural organizations who share a public-private partnership with the City of New York and are located at all five boroughs. During this pandemic, the CIGs have provided essential programs and resources to advance and support public health, public life, and public benefit. Snug Harbor's challenges in the face of COVID-19 are shared by many across the arts and culture sector. My position supports volunteer programs and school-based learning services that directly benefit the public health and life of our communities. Snug Harbor provides critical life sciences education to New York City public school students, servicing over 30,000 students annually, 60% from Title I schools. We serve the children of frontline workers at a regional enrichment center. Remotely and in person, we provided hands-on transformative learning experiences. With support from the city council through a greener NYC, Snug Harbor provides green education and workforce development opportunities on our heritage farm, on our 10 acres of state map wetlands, and across our 83 acre campus. Participants gained hard and soft skills while developing a peer community and addressing community needs. Although Snug Harbor's grounds have remained open throughout this pandemic, we had to pause in-person programs in the spring. We created virtual programs with Wagner College, City Access New York, and the Department of Education's Work, Learn, Grow students. At the conclusion, the students will have gained necessary academic skills, and Snug Harbor will have the first draft of a volunteer management handbook. Following city guidelines, we restarted in-person programs in September. Participants from the Department of Probation's Youth Rep Program, Lifestyles for the Disabled, Hope Church, and New Ventures Charter School worked side by side on environmental stewardship and advocacy. We launched a Snug Harbor Youth Volunteers Initiative in partnership with City University's Powell School of Global and Civic Leadership, pairing local high school Time students and community graduates in environmental stewardship. Snug Harbor and the CIGs know the unprecedented financial challenges facing our city. Please do not overlook the critical role that our organizations play in supporting public health, public life, and public benefit in our communities. Let us work together to bring New York back better and more vibrant than ever. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the last member of this panel is Angel Hernandez from the New York Botanical Garden. Starting time. Good morning, Chairman Van Bramer and members of the committee. On behalf of the New York Botanical Garden, NYBG, thank you for letting me testify today and for all your hard work in supporting our city's thriving arts and culture community, especially during these unprecedented times. As we grapple with the continuing effects of COVID-19, arts and culture become even more crucial for the coping and recovery of its wearied citizens. Despite any setbacks, our city's cultural institutions continue to serve through remote and safe in-person programming because culture never closes. NYBG is a member of the city cultural institutions group. Throughout the COVID-19 crisis, all CIGs have been committed to contributing to the city and to New Yorkers by supporting public life, public health, and public service. In the realm of public health, the garden stepped up at the onset of the pandemic to feed the Bronx in a healthy way by donating, th donating thousands of pounds of fresh produce to neighboring charities and public schools. Also, NYBG created eight food hubs organized by groups of community gardens throughout the borough. In the realm of public life, NYBG is a cultural and educational anchor for all in the Bronx community. Since given permission to welcome the public back in July, NYBG began to offer any Bronx resident and healthcare worker free access totaling tens of thousands of visits so far. Lastly, NYBG's efforts in the realm of public service were demonstrated when Garda's staff immediately shifted into free remote programming at the onset of the pandemic. Our innovative online programs covered diverse topics of discussion, ranging from the intersectionality of history and the LGBTQ community in botanical research and sciences 
to the reconsideration of the conscious omission of black knowledge of the natural world. Also, all of our school programs have been modified to be conducted virtually. Yet, all these free online programs cannot maximize for diverse audiences without adequate broadband access, especially for our low income communities. With a growing trend in online programming and socially distant learning, getting everyone connected online must be a topic of ongoing work by the mayor and city council. Thank you very much. So, uh, yes, uh, Angel, uh, thank you for bringing up that uh, incredibly important piece of this, uh, which uh, doesn't get nearly enough attention. And uh, we can do all the online programming in the world, but if there isn't uh, complete and total uh, access and equal access, uh, then we're still not doing uh, our jobs. Uh, so needless to say, the administration uh, could <laughs> um, do more to uh, uh, fix this uh, right away and, uh, and should and must. Um, I want to thank all of you. Uh, did want to go back to uh, uh, Toya Lillard um, uh, just because very compelling testimony and vibes uh, mission uh, uh, is incredibly uh, important. And uh, uh, do you have uh, uh, online programming? Are you, what is your, 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 your situation in terms of your ability to actually uh, project out that mission and serve your uh, constituency? Thank you so much for the opportunity uh, and for your question. Yes, uh, we did what people are calling pivoting, but uh, what we had to do first was do a needs assessment um, for our young women and their communities because we are in Brooklyn. And as you all know, uh, March and April were horrifying months, uh, particularly here in Brooklyn and the communities that we serve. So based up on what our young women said, they needed the programming because um, their homes were not sanctuaries. They were under tremendous pressure. I didn't think it was possible to create theater um, virtually. I, I just didn't. And it was uh, them uh, and our staff who really convinced me of the possibilities. Our girls had already been doing things virtually and had been imagining a virtual world and had um, already been initiated into this idea. So they helped us to pivot. They helped us to deepen our engagement and also um, made it possible for us to uh, offer these programs nationally now since we're virtual. So before you would need to be um, come to Brooklyn. Now um, we're reaching girls that would never have been able to participate in our programs. The second thing is when the um, summer youth employment program was canceled, it was our girls that let us know how devastating an impact it was and that they not only couldn't, they, they couldn't participate in our virtual program any, anymore, but they were really worried about getting out there and finding jobs, which may Made us again pivot and ex become more even more expansive and find the money to uh, not maybe match what the, they would have been paid by SYEP but come very close to it and also um, I want to just shout out we're proud members of the coalition of theaters of color uh, and the high quality theater that we produce is uh, has made it worth it and so um, our young women the training programs that we were able to offer still maintaining them and becoming again even more expansive reaching more young women. So um, by really asking them what they needed and wanted, by engaging our community partners and the folks that um, trusted and believed our work, and also um, through the hard work of our young staff, we were able to uh, change our organization forever. Some of these things will stay, are being institutionalized. For example, full health benefits for all staff, no matter if you're part-time or full-time. We're an organization staffed and run by black women. It's important, um, as you know, in this environment to think about our mental health, our physical health, uh, and to be expansive and to think of the arts as um, being also expansive and being able to provide community care. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and you are uh, relatively new members of CTC. Oh, can we unmute uh, Toya? Is There's Toya a delay. We're, we're unmuting. One, sorry, one okay. second. Okay. 
Wait one moment. Oh, she should be unmuted. Yes, we've been members of the CTC since 2015. Shout out to Cam uh, to Majority Leader Lori Combo for making that happen for us. Uh, so yeah, it's been about five years. That's great. And uh, uh, the CTC was virtually the only cultural uh, budget item not cut uh, this year, as you know, and the Majority Leader and I fought uh, really hard in the budget negotiating team uh, to make that. So, so uh, the program, as you know, has been greatly expanded. It should be expanded even more uh, uh, and uh, uh, not cutting a budget uh, is, uh, while that is uh, a success, um, uh, shouldn't be the, the baseline of what we're looking for, uh, right? We should be expanding uh, right. these budgets, uh, particularly uh, a budget line like this that was um, is the only one of its kind uh, in in the city of New York and uh, serves incredibly uh, important organizations like yours. So thank you for for the work and and uh, illuminating all of us. Uh, and thank you to Juan Carlos uh, and Jake Hal for that uh, energetic, uh, uh, fierce representation of a great. Uh, a great Queens organization uh, that I love, uh, and uh, uh, Puyan at Snug Harbor, um, and uh, uh, and of course Angel. So uh, with this panel, thank you very much, and I'll turn it back to our our committee council. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, we'll just take one second to check if there's any other council member questions. Please use the raise hand function. We're not seeing any questions for this panel. So we'll conclude and move to the next panel. Thank you. The next panelist will be Alejandra Duque Cifuentes, Sophia Morris Pittman from Dance Theater of Harlem, Amanda Adams Lewis, and Aaron Reed. Uh, so Ms. Cifuentes from Dance NYC, you may begin once the sergeant calls the clock. Thank you. Starting time. Hello, apologies, I was having technical difficulties. We hear you, thank you. Great. Um, hello, Council Member Jimmy Van Bramer and folks from City Council, thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, my name is Alejandra Lucas y Fuentes, I'm the Executive Director of Dance NYC. And on behalf of Dance NYC, a service organization which serves over 5,000 individual artists, 1,200 dance making entities, and many, many nonprofit organizations and for-profit folks in the New York City metropolitan area. Um, we are so very grateful that there is a hearing that is happening specifically on arts education. Um, really, we are calling and requesting for the city to continue to provide sustained and dedicated funding to support arts and education in schools and communities, including quality arts education for every child in every school. Um, for budget cuts, um, either present or future, to not fall disproportionately on the Department of Education, Department of Youth and Community Development, um, and the work that so many of the different um, cultural organizations are doing in relation to the Department of Education um, and for the city to continue to allow flexibility with the uh, cultural after school adventures programming, um, particularly in response to the pandemic. Um, and and, and uh, less obvious um, for the city to support the, the dance specific COVID-19 guidelines that we are putting forth that um, right now the current reopening guidelines do not uh, provide guidance to dance studios and education spaces that have been either forced to um, remain closed or haven't gotten enough information so that they can reopen safely. Uh, what we do know, however, is that dance and culture has not stopped throughout the pandemic. Even folks that have not been able to come in person have continued to provide quality dance education to communities um, for students, for parents. We can't tell you the number of parents that we get calling us or emailing us asking where in their local communities they can find spaces of, of dance Time education expired. or arts education. Um, and so in this moment, we're really just asking for a continued support. We need educators in every school. We cannot continue to bleed out this um, aspect of the work that the arts and cultural sector does. 
So many dance businesses and organizations also depend on their contracts with DOE to continue to support their workers and communities. And so we are just uh, really pushing for a continued focus on education as a key component of the ba cultural backbone of the city um, and the relationship that arts education has with so many other city agencies and so many other businesses and industries that uh, further support the workforce and our local communities. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you so much. Our next panelist will be Sophia Morris Pittman from the Dance Theater of Harlem. Starting time. Greetings, New York City Council Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. Dance Theater of Harlem is a world renowned classical ballet company and school founded by the late Arthur Mitchell who was the first African-American to be principal dancer in a major ballet company. Mr. Mitchell shifted the paradigm of the dance industry and paved the way for dancers of color to have access to ballet. He made ballet inclusive. This has projected the organization as a cultural cornerstone of the performing arts. DTH, as it's fondly known, has engaged in arts education with the New York City public school system now for almost 50 years. However, like many other organizations, we too have been affected drastically by COVID-19. Due to budget cuts, we've had to lay off teaching artists and other part-time staff, and um, we have cut back drastically our direct services to schools, students, and the community when they need us the most. So we implore you to fund arts education Arts education is essential work. It helps children to thrive socially. Youth that are connected to other children are happier, they're less anxious and have more fun. NYU Langone Health Center. Movement exercise also improves depression and anxiety symptoms. It releases feel good endorphins, it takes your mind out of worries and you gain self-confidence and helps one to cope. We cannot cut back on physical and the emotional nourishment of our children. Arts education is essential. Arts education is reasonable. Arts education is about physical, mental, and emotional sustainability. I'm Let's take care of our children. Thank you. I am Sophia Morris Pittman, Arts Education Manager for Dance Theater of Harlem. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, the next panelist will be Amanda Adams Lewis. Starting time. Thank you. Good morning, City Council members. Good morning, uh, Council Member Van Bramer. Thank you for your leadership on this issue. My name is Amanda Adams Louis and I am a teaching artist. I have worked with New York City high school students and uh, facilitated professional development workshops for high school teachers in remote learning and digital media since March 16th. I'm here to testify today to highlight how teaching artists can be critical partners to the city and to students in rebuilding our city and empowering and supporting our young people through this difficult time. I'd like to start out by echoing the words of my students and sharing direct testimony from them. Unfortunately, they couldn't be here today because they're in class. Um, very grateful for high school to art school, Queens Council on the Arts, for giving me and my peers the opportunity to grow and learn from portfolio reviews. They make sure that we are focused on the right things in the college process. And that's testimony from um, Corrales Rivera, a senior at Frank Sinatra High School. Q Arts Foundation provided a smooth transition from in-person to online activities. While NYC had been put on hold, Q hadn't. Because of detailed instruction and consistent guidance from my teachers, I was capable of producing my best work in the middle of a pandemic. Aurora Hidalgo, a senior at the High School for Construction Trades, Engineering, and Architecture. As I said before, my name is Amanda Adams Louis. I'm a teaching artist. And in March, my colleagues and I at the Q Art Foundation and Queens Council on the Arts transitioned our education programs from in person to remote learning without disruption. 
In fact, we spent the weekend um, of the 16th transitioning, moving supplies and making sure that we were able to provide materials for our students and set up the digital tech remote learning to echo Toya Lillard's. We did a needs assessment to check in with our participants um, and to also echo Angel Martinez. Um, we made sure and figured out ways to ensure that all of our participants had broadband access because that is I'm a major fire. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your leadership. I urge you to continue providing funding for city organizations and cultural institutions that deliver direct services to uh, New York City's young people. Thank you for your time. Thank you. You didn't get cut off there, Amanda, did you? You got to say everything you wanted to say? I got cut off, but in the interest of the other participants on the call, um, I'm, I'm ending. <laughs> okay. You're, you're very kind. I'm going to come back to you anyway um, and ask you a couple of questions. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. and Thank you so much. We have one more pan uh, panelist on the panel, Aaron Reed. You may begin when the sergeant starts the clock. Starting time. Hi all, uh, my name is Erin Reed. I've been a teaching artist and a museum educator in New York for over three years at the Rubin Museum of Art and the Tenement Museum. I'm completing my master's in K through 12 art education to continue this work. Um, thank you for this opportunity to be in conversation. Um, and I really just wanna ground my statements in the reality that COVID-19 continues to disproportionately impact Black, Indigenous, and people of color due to racism and structural inequities in our healthcare, housing, and criminal punishment systems, or to name a few. And of course, as we've heard today, arts and cultural education is not immune to structural racism. And this past year has highlighted this truth in sharp relief, uh, mass layoffs in the arts, most significantly in arts education, as we've heard, have hit BIPOC cultural workers the hardest. Uh, and pre-existing budget inequities have soared in this crisis and left art ed organizations centering BIPOC communities even more vulnerable than before. Um, within museums and cultural institutions, BIPOC workers tend to be the most represented within front-facing staff, so education, but also visitor services, security, shop staff, positions which are usually among the lowest paid work and the most precarious labor. Uh, from my experience as a former educator at the Tenement Museum, the layoffs of the entire part-time staff in, in July gutted a majority of workers of color and it left behind an institution that is overwhelmingly white. Uh, there are no longer any educators of color on staff at the Tenement Museum today. Uh, and this is an institution that sees thousands of students every year, most of whom who are students of color learning about history. Um, the story is similar at cultural institutions across the city. And so I implore you to advocate for increased wages and benefits for part-time and front-facing arts education staff and to continue to prioritize funding to arts education programs and institutions that serve predominantly people of color. It is unacceptable to me that the budget distribution between boroughs remains so uneven and, and it generates a lack of access to the arts for our most vulnerable students. And lastly, I just want to salute our educators across the city for our ability to use creative thinking and to strategize new and innovative ways to reach our students. As we've I'm heard in fine. some of the, um, the testimonies today, our adaptiveness and flexibility is what makes our educators some of the most well positioned to deal with a crisis of this magnitude. Uh, and in particular, there's a continued resilience and radical capacity for imagination of BIPOC cultural workers and art educators that keeps us afloat. And New York City needs our voices and our ideas. Thank you so much. Thank you. Chair Nope. Uh, little feedback there. Uh, you can hear me though, right? We can hear you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, thank you, Aaron, uh, for that uh, very powerful testimony. And uh, uh, I had already been thinking this, but uh, if, if you've been following along, um, most of the people who testified so far are in fact women of color. Um, who are uh, helping to lead uh, uh, this fight. And uh, I'm grateful uh, for uh, that um, and thrilled to see uh, so many folks here. Um, and uh, I wanna thank you um, and uh, Amanda as well, who's still there, right? Um, yes, um, a teaching artist. And uh, ask Amanda, because I you mentioned Queens Council on the Arts. Um, is is that how your work is is funded in part? Are you a, a, a grantee or what is the relationship between your work and, and QCA? 
I am a um, part-time staff member at QCA. I am one of the co-instructors for the High School to Art School program, a program that prepares first-generation, low-income, and underserved youth um, to apply to art schools and colleges and develop portfolios. And last year, we raised and collaborated with students to garner $3.5 million in scholarship money for young people attending college. That's, uh, that's pretty awesome. Uh, and just want to Thank you, and I and I think you know to Aaron's greater point, which is uh, absolutely correct in terms of equity and funding uh, to organizations uh, and access. Um, you know, we haven't uh, as a city gotten there, but there have been some things that that we've pushed at the council. Uh, one is to uh, dramatically increase funding for the Coalition of Theaters of Color and make sure that that budget was untouched this year when everything else was getting whacked. Um, uh, and I voted against the budget because I thought we should uh, uh, defund the NYPD and uh, reallocate that funding elsewhere. But, um, but one of the other things that we've done the last couple of years is uh, dramatically increase funding to the five borough-wide arts councils um, so that we could actually reach individual artists uh, in the boroughs, um, many of whom are um, uh, BIPOC um, artists and, um, and educators. So, you know, it's, it's just good to hear, Amanda, your story and, and that, uh, you know, uh, the arts councils are, are doing some good work with that, that uh, uh, increase in funding. Obviously, uh, I'm a proponent of increasing all of that. Um, and, and again, you know, Aaron, we haven't, uh, we have not fixed this uh, structural uh, problem by any uh, uh, by any measure, but uh, I do think Commissioner Casals, um, you know, is someone who who knows this issue, feels it personally, and and would like to work uh, on 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 getting something done. But uh, and I'll just this my only political point is we're going to have to elect a mayor who uh, is, is really committed to the arts and really committed to equity. Um, and, and I think that's when you're gonna really start to see uh, movement with a newly uh, empowered and progressive city council that uh, uh, you know, can, can move the issue. Part of that is also, and this really will be my last political point, is making sure that we have uh, elected officials who care about the arts, right, uh, and who, uh, you know, we're, we're really actually asking people, you know, not just their positions on transportation and education, but what's your position on the arts, arts and education funding, equity in cultural funding, you know, making sure that we're doing all the things that uh, we need to do. Uh, so I would just uh, say that and I'll get off my political soapbox for a second, but uh, thank you, Aaron, for centering uh, us in the way that, that you just did. Uh, and Alejandra, I think is still here. Um, uh, you are a fierce advocate for uh, Dance NYC and the dance community and uh, really, really, really uh, respect your work. And uh, Sophia, uh, who I don't see immediately on the box, but just wanna, oh, there you are, I do see you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, dance Theater of Harlem is uh, an amazing organization. It pains me to hear you talk about uh, reductions of any kind um, in, in the work that you do. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, you know, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to, uh, uh, to, uh, to be re as resilient as possible, but uh, uh, too much is being asked of you um, and uh, uh, too many sacrifices being asked of, of uh, artists, arts organizations, particularly uh, uh, communities of color. So, um, with that, I just want to thank all of you for your work, um, for being here, and for representing um, uh, your communities and artists and the young people that you serve, most importantly. Thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer um, and members of the panel. Uh, we're just going to check for council member questions before we move on from the panel. Um, and we are not seeing any council member questions. So if there are none, we will move to the next panel. Thank you. 
All right, so we will call the next four panelists um, and then individuals by name again. So the next panelist or the next panel will be Casey Angelo from Groundswell, Lucy Sexton from New Yorkers for Culture and Arts, Alexander Koppelman from Children's Art Guild, and Blair Revis Tyler from the Elvin Ailey Dance Foundation. So Casey Angelo, um, you are the next witness and you may begin when the sergeant calls the clock. Thank you so much. Starting time. Thank you to the city council for the opportunity to testify in support of arts education. My name is Casey Angelo and I work at Groundswell Community Mural Project in Brooklyn. Groundswell is a nonprofit community arts organization that engages youth in creative processes to inspire community engagement, racial justice, and social change. Over the past 25 years, Groundswell has served over 7,000 young people in the completion of over 600 murals and works of art across the five boroughs. Groundswell is currently offering an array of free remote arts programming and professional development for artists and educators, and we remain committed to responding to the emerging needs of the communities we serve. In fact, in the face of SYEP cuts this past summer, we stepped up and provided stipends to our participants. Within and beyond the pandemic, issues around space, erasure, and gentrification are threats to the safety and security of many New Yorkers. We know that the act of uplifting and centering unheard voices through arts and culture helps build and rebuild healthy community life. Groundswell is ready and eager to take proactive steps toward that end, but we cannot do it without your support. In order for this to happen, the DOE, DCA, and DYCD need sustained and dedicated funding for CASA and CDF-backed programs. In a time of crisis, let us not perpetuate a white supremacist culture by divesting from the already underserved and undervalued members of our communities. Indeed, programs that foster mental health and community rejuvenation should be the last cut, not the first. With your continued support, Groundswell will continue to support the path to a more just world through the social and emotional health of young people. And we know that arts and creative engagement is vital to this process. Thank you for your time and for your leadership. Thank you so much. The next panelist is Lucy Sexton. Starting time. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer and members of the City Council for hearing my and so many others' testimony. And thank you and the entire City Council for, for all the care and work you have been doing for our city in this crisis. My name is Lucy Sexton. I'm proud to head New Yorkers for Culture and Arts, a citywide coalition of cultural groups of every size from every neighborhood. The damage of COVID to every artist, culture worker, and organization has been immense and the damage to arts education among the most serious. There have been many studies on the impact of arts and cultural education in schools. Last year, an article in the Times detailed the many ways that arts integrated into the curriculum improved outcomes. From the article, I quote, the arts can be a source of joy in a child's day and also come in handy for memorizing timetables. Neuroscience suggests that arts education can play additional important roles in how ch children learn. Dr. Marielle Hardiman said, we found the biggest difference with children, it, the biggest difference in outcomes with children at the lower level of achievement. Could this be at least one lever for closing an achievement gap? I think so. This fall, the Brookings Institute did another study affirming other benefits of arts and education. There were upticks in standardized test scores, reductions in disciplinary infractions, and marked increases in compassion for others. To quote from that research, increases in arts learning positively and significantly affects students' school engagement, college aspirations, and their inclinations to draw upon works of art as a means for empathizing with others. So a crisis for arts and culture and education is a crisis for our kids and a crisis for our city. As you'll hear from many others today, it's also a crisis for artists who teach. An NPR show this morning detailed the devastating impact on artists' livelihoods. I also want to lift up the critical work of the Office of Arts and Special Projects at the DOE in making arts in schools be effective. So many have noted that New York City has the most segregated school system in the country. Shocking. Time expired. 
The inequity plays out when it comes to arts and culture for school children with the wealthiest, whitest schools providing PTA funds to pay art teachers and the poorest schools in black and brown neighborhoods going without. So as you struggle during this time of crisis and upheaval, we ask that you break with the past. Instead of cutting arts and culture first, instead of slashing arts ed, instead of abandoning those neighborhoods hardest hit, we ask that you imagine a city where every kid in every neighborhood deserves the educational benefits, the dignity, the healing, and the joy that culture provides. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank so you much. Lucy. I just want to, uh, before we hear from the next panelists, you know, chime in that um, when we were negotiating the budget in June, and uh, I heard about the Department of Education uh, arts cuts. Uh, uh, you know, I, I spoke out uh, against and then spoke to the chancellor and others. And, and, uh, and I know he cares about uh, equity, um, but, you know, we know that our public school system uh, is uh, mostly children of color. And if you cut arts and education, you are by definition uh, depriving uh, young children and students of color the opportunity to have access to these programs. And so it should be the last thing that gets cut. Um, and, uh, and, you know, obviously the mayor um, and the department uh, went through with significant cuts um, to the Department of Education's uh, arts and ed budget. Um, the council, as you know, was much more successful in beating back uh, cuts. Uh, and uh, obviously, you know, that's my job to lead that fight as the chair of this committee. Um, but uh, I, you know, I agree with uh, you and, you know, again, not to get too political, but there were lots of reasons why I voted against the budget. But um, this is one of them, right, is we we had our priorities backwards and um, cut incredibly important uh, programs and, um, and funded some things that we shouldn't. And just to underline that those cuts are not equal, right? Because my kids go to school in Manhattan and the PTA raises money for those arts teachers. So we don't suffer that loss. Kids in the boroughs, kids in communities of color do suffer it. So, so as someone who was at PS 111 last week, and I talked about PS 111 next week. Uh, I am acutely aware that there are uh, some schools in my district uh, that have the ability uh, to have uh, significant, not insignificant, but significant uh, fundraising, as you mentioned, um, uh, towards the PTA activities, which then often are you know, funneled into additional programs and services. And, um, and, and then there are schools that do not have that ability. And uh, that, is, uh, that, is, that is fundamentally you know, unjust and uh, an inequity that is real. And, um, and it is why we, uh, we do put additional resources um, into uh, some of our schools that are, um, you know, that, that just don't have that, those abilities. So uh, trust me, I, I, I have experienced that uh, personally and uh, have done what I could to, uh, to adjust that, but that is, that is reality, Lucy. Thanks, Jeremy. That a reality that has to be changed. Um, sorry, next panelist. Thank you so much, Chair Van Bremer. Uh, the next panelist again will be Alexander Koppelman from the Children's Art Guild. Starting time. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Chair Van Bremer and uh, committee members. It's, a, it's an honor to appear before you today. And thank you so much for taking up this important issue of arts education uh, during the pandemic. I wanna take a moment to acknowledge how um, honored I am uh, by being among so many dedicated and passionate um, arts educators and artists. Uh, it's a real, um, it's a pleasure for me. Uh, my name is Alexander Koppelman. I'm a co-founder and president and CEO of the Children's Arts Guild. Um, the Guild is a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping children 
harness their creativity to transcend limiting expectations and to explore and develop their authentic selves. We're based on the Lower East Side in Manhattan, and we work with children primarily in District 1 schools uh, through after-school programs in uh, serving very diverse community. When schools closed on March 16th, we quickly shifted to offering programs online and almost immediately noticed a disturbing pattern. Children who were attending online programs tended to be primarily from higher income families. Uh, when we inquired among members of our parent community, families with limited economic resources reported a variety of barriers to having their children participate. Um, these included living conditions not conducive to learning, lack of access to technology and connectivity, and most importantly, parents' inability to help their children connect and stay engaged. This observation has been corroborated by educators with whom we work through professional development programs. Throughout the past nine months, teachers have been reporting to us how the pandemic has exacerbated the effects of socioeconomic inequalities for their students. Um, as schools and organizations like ours adapt to distance learning, we're in danger of further widening this gap between children from diverse socioeconomic backgrounds. We call on the Council and the administration to allocate funding to ensuring that online arts and cultural education is accessible to all children. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on this important issue and for working to ensure children benefit from arts education. Thank you very much. Is that this panel? Uh... Uh, there's one more panelist. Okay, got it. The last member of this pan panel is Blair Revis Tyler from Alvin Ailey. Starting time. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, again, my name is Blair Revis Tyler, and I work with Ailey Arts and Education and Community Programs with the Alvin Ailey Dance Foundation. I'm also a graduate of the Fordham University and Alvin Ailey Bachelor of Fine Arts Program. And on behalf of my organization, I would like to thank the New York City Council members for your continued support across several program areas and for selecting Ailey as a cultural provider for the Cultural After School Adventures Program. Through the CASA grants and other funds awarded to Ailey by the council, our 2020-21 school partners are very excited and deeply grateful for the opportunity and financial support to participate in our remote virtual programs. Our community partners have expressed feedback that the arts have been and will continue to be a critical outlet and resource for their youth, especially during the era of COVID-19. One of our longtime school partners commented that the DOE's budget cuts led to their students feeling upset that they might not be able to dance with Ailey this year. A school principal has shared with us the following quote in regard to being able to conduct an Ailey residency remotely this year. Quote, I'm so happy to hear that the residency can continue and I know that our students will especially enjoy having this opportunity for connection and enrichment. End quote from the principal of PS344X and Park Neighborhood School. And that school is a CASA participant. The council's commitment to equity and arts education is a leading factor in Ailey's annual reach each year. Our average number of students in New York City DOE schools who participated in Ailey's programs over the past two years is just over 6,000 students reached annually. However, the impact of the pandemic on schools has resulted in fewer schools that are able to support arts education programs. And we are unsure if we will be able to reach 1,000 students this year an 83.5% reduction in the number of DOE students served. Disruption to our programs and the discrepancy in the number we may reach this year could result in negative effects on those students missing out. The stress of the pandemic is having, Time traumatic, effect, is having traumatic effects on New York City students. Such severe changes to one's security and well-being can overwhelm a person's coping responses, in turn impacting motivation and energy level in class. The arts provide creative coping tools and space for social support that buffer against traumatic stress. New York City youth need the arts to nurture their emotional and physical well-being, as well as reinforce the principles they learn throughout their academic journeys. And so we are counting on you, uh, Chairman Van Bramer, and uh, the City Council, and we're on your con continuing your help to maintain a strong support network for arts education programs. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, uh, Blair, and uh, if you could unmute Blair, because I'm going to ask uh, Blair a couple of questions. Um, so the 83% reduction is as a result of the DOE arts and education cuts, right? Because uh, I assume that most of your CASA grants were continued and you will be able to do that programming. 
Well, we did receive the CASA grants, uh, which is incredibly amazing to have received it this year. We weren't sure what the outcome would be, but given once we received that news, we have been reaching out to the schools to start to facilitate uh, the programs and start our planning process. And we're finding out that the capacity of some of the schools that, that have been awarded the, the grants, um, it's looking like some schools are luckier and have, have more of a capacity to be able to host a program uh, with as many requirements as the CASA program. Um, we're waiting, uh, we're working with our development office uh, to find out if, if we have any flexibility with the, the restrictions and requirements of the grant to uh, see whether or not, or how, how much leeway we have to work with the school to kind of accommodate their, their shifting learning models. Um, but so far, uh, I believe we've got nine or 10 awards um, and, and so far it's, it's at this point in the year, we're working with about four who've been awarded that grant, which is amazing, which is incredibly amazing. But again, that's, it's certainly at this point in the year, um, fewer than, than we normally would. Um, and so at this point in the year, at the end of the first <coughs> semester, there are fewer students being served at this point. Um, but we're, we're very hopeful um, about the rest, the remainder of the year and we'll continue to work with our schools um, that haven't started yet and see how we can uh, be flexible and, and, and just work to accommodate their, their, um, their schedules and their capacity. Yeah, well, I hope uh, uh, you'll reach out uh, and we can maybe work with you and the Department of Cultural Affairs and the City Council to make sure, because this is a council cultural initiative, that everyone is as flexible as possible to allow you to access uh, the grants if you've been awarded uh, nine or 10. Uh, I know that I, of course, allocate a CASA grant to Alvin Ailey so that PS111, uh, the school in Queensbridge uh, has mm -hmm. the program. And uh, if there are any issues with that program, uh, please let me know. Um, Certainly. And uh, because, you know, and I never get tired of, of telling this story, but in the first year that I was a city council member, one of my first school visits was to PS 111. They have a beautiful dance studio in PS 111. Mm -hmm. But the principal at the time informed me that there was no programming uh, available in that beautiful brand new dance studio that had been privately funded. Um, and so that's why I awarded Alvin Ailey a CASA grant uh, to activate that space mm -hmm. and uh, to make sure that uh, the children at that school would also be able to see ballet dancers who looked like themselves um, at PS 111. And uh, the first year that I went to the end of the year program, uh, you know, at the end of the year, uh, Ailey uh, has the children perform uh, what they've learned all year uh, at the in the auditorium and I went and um, it was a beautiful performance and at the end they offered the opportunity for all the children to do freestyle performance they could dance on their own at the very end mm -hmm. and most of the kids were a little shy and uh, a, a young woman who was in the middle school uh, uh, danced and was amazing and afterwards I went up on the stage and saw the kids and I said to her, you were simply amazing and it was brave and, uh, and great. And the principal pulled me aside and she said, that young woman who you spoke to uh, at the very beginning of this uh, year was going through some very, very uh, traumatic things in her life and was not doing well in school and not responsive. But we got her enrolled in the Ailey program and you can see that her participation in this program has changed her life. Uh, we followed that young woman through high school and through graduation. Um, I believe that that program saved her life, absolutely changed her life. Um, and, uh, and so it is incredibly important to me that uh, the Ailey CASA program continue at PS 111. Um, and, uh, Again, if there are any issues, please you know reach out to me directly. Certainly, um, um, I'm sure you'll be happy to know that we are in the process of of confirming scheduling with PS 111, so they are on track to begin in the second semester. I think it'll be great. great. Thank you for Thank your leadership you. on this cause. No, I absolutely uh, I love it. I love Alvin Ailey. Uh, I love uh, PS 111, and um, 
and I love this program. Um, and thank you uh, to everyone. Groundswell, again, does amazing work. Um, and uh, Lucy, thank you for uh, all of your uh, leadership on all things uh, culture and the arts. Um, and um, uh, Alexander as well, thank you uh, to all. Thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer. Um, so this is the end of the panel. Before we move to the next panel, we'll just do one last check for council member questions. If there are any other council members, we are not seeing any hands. So we'll move to the next panel. Um, again, we'll call four names, uh, followed by individual names. The next panel will be Angeline Gregassine. Um, and again, please excuse any pronunciation. Asari Beal, Kimberly Olson, and Lulu Fogarty. The next, so the next witness will be Angeline Gregersine. Gregor, um, you may begin when the sergeant calls the clock. Time starts now. Thank you to the committee. My name is Angeline Gregasson and I am a Filipino American artist based in Ridgewood, Queens. I am also the co-founder and director of a grassroots community organization called Happy Family Night Market, an annual festival that celebrates the Asian diaspora through food, art, and education. Our interdisciplinary programming consists of food, film, and live music festivals, site-specific and participatory artworks, hands-on craft and culinary workshops, a marketplace for artisans and publishers, comedy and drag performances, and panel discussions on cultural assimilation and appropriation. We create value for our community by centering Asian voices and challenging colonial notions of Asia. We provide cultural representation as a form of social justice. Since 2018, we've supported over 300 artists, 80 speakers and educators, and 30 chefs, and drawn nearly 4,000 attendees. The pandemic shutdown forced us to postpone our annual festival indefinitely, eliminating 100% of our income for the 2020 fiscal year. Our business model and strategic plan was rendered null and void. And because we had declared a loss on our 2019 tax return, we were ineligible for a PPP loan to cover our expenses. I lost my entire nine person team to the economic pressures of the pandemic who were forced to abandon this project in search of full-time employment with established corporations who could offer a competitive salary. I myself have been staying afloat these past nine months by collecting unemployment benefits as a self-employed small business owner. Despite these challenges during the pandemic, I've managed to grow our audience, recruit a new team of volunteers and pivot from live to digital programming. For small arts and cultural organizations like mine, we urgently need the city support. We need right now, 0% interest loans or low interest forgivable loans of up to $50,000 to startup founders exclusively in the arts and cultural sector who serve underrepresented communities. And in the future, grants and subsidies to cover long-term leases for office space, rehearsal and performance space. Time expired commercial kitchen space, as well as street permits and licenses for large scale public art projects. Thank you for your consideration and support. Thank you so much for your testimony. The next uh, panelist will be Asari Beal from Teachers and Writers uh, Collaborative. Thank you. I'm starting Thank now. Thank you to the committee for the opportunity to present a testimony in support of arts education. My name is Asari Beal, and I am the Executive Director of Teachers and Writers Collaborative. As one of the first writers in the schools programs in the country, Teachers and Writers has partnered with New York City Public Schools to increase access to the literary arts for over 50 years, offering innovative creative writing programs taught by poets, playwrights, novelists, and other professional writers. We also offer arts programs for seniors and resources for teachers. We're based in Brooklyn and serve communities throughout the city. The pandemic has changed everything about the way we operate. In terms of funding, we anticipate a loss of over 70% of revenue from Department of Education contracts due to cuts to school budgets and initiatives like College Access for All, through which we used creative writing as a tool for college readiness. Their loss represents about one fifth of our operating budget. We're still uncertain about funding from other sources, such as the Department of Cultural Affairs, although I hope to find a letter waiting for me when I return to my office. The immediate impact of this loss is a reduction in the number of programs we're able to offer and the number of students that we serve. 
With each school operating in different configurations of in-person and remote learning, the logistics of partnership are straining our staff and our organizational resources. There is a silver lining to all of this. Since March, we success successfully transitioned all of our programs for youth and older adults to offer them remotely. Our programs continue to offer students the social and emotional learning that is so needed right now. They have high attendance rates and get students excited about showing up in the remote learning space to write poems, plays, and stories. Our remote senior programs, including a storytelling workshop for visually impaired seniors, are well attended and create vital social networks during this time of isolation. In short, our programs are still doing what they have always done. Time increase access to the arts, Increase access to the arts, build community, and empower the voices of our youth. Arts education programs like ours are needed in New York City more than ever. The City Council can support our work by championing, championing arts education, ensuring funding for the arts through the Department of um, Education, Department of Cultural Affairs, and including City Council initiatives like Casa and Sukasa. I know the city is in crisis, but I believe arts education uh, organizations like ours can be a resource. We can help with the most critical problems students in schools are facing this year, such as teacher shortages, social emotional learning needs, and student absenteeism. We can improve the quality of life for seniors who are sheltering at home, and we can continue to create jobs for teaching artists who are at the heart and soul of arts and culture in New York City. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. The next panelist, we have two more on this panel, will be Kimberly Olson from New York City Arts and Education Roundtable. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer, the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Commissioner Consoles, and the staff at DCLA for your leadership and commitment to arts education. Also, congratulations on the passing of the Open Culture Bill. My name is Kimberly Olson, and I'm the Executive Director of the New York City Arts and Education Roundtable and a proud Long Island City resident. The Roundtable is a service organization that builds its efforts around the values that arts are essential and that arts education is a right for all New York City students. Our 120 plus member organizations have worked in longstanding partnership with the DOE to ensure that every child has access to quality arts learning. We acknowledge that our great city is in crisis, but we at the Roundtable believe that the pathway forward includes investing in arts education as part of the city's recovery. The cuts to arts education programs have not only stripped away much needed resources from our young New Yorkers, but jeopardized the livelihood of thousands of artists and cultural workers. Earlier this year, the Roundtable administered a relief fund to education, cultural workers, and the arts impacted by COVID-19. 80% of those applicants had been furloughed or laid off. 85% had estimated their 2020 annual income to be under $30,000, well under New York City's poverty threshold. We are grateful from the support we have garnered from the Department of Cultural Affairs to engage in another round of relief funding to support these highly specialized workers. As we rebuild from these dual pandemics, investment in cultural partnerships put artists to work in communities and drives movement towards a more equitable education system. We seek city council's help as the field of arts education fights its way towards this time through this time of economic strife. To rebuild and sustain arts education programs, we believe the city must reinstate a DOE system-wide per capita funds for arts learning akin to the Project Arts Program, increase accountability around arts learning in schools by mandating that every school includes the arts as part of their comprehensive education plan, offer a one-year extension to cultural organizations with MTAC contracts expiring between March 2020 and June 2021. With Time expired with a suggestion that an audit of the contracting system be conducted after the pandemic, and also restoring cuts to art services at the DOE and CASA programs in the FY22 budget. Now in partnership with OASP and certified arts teachers, our cultural partners are ready and able to continue working with schools and students. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you. Um, Chair Van Bramer, did you have, we have one more panelist. No, okay. we'll listen to all four and then I'll, I'll have some thoughts. Thank you. Um, the last member of this panel will be Lulu Fogarty from Bridging Education and Art Together. Time starts now. Thank you for your time. I'm Lulu Fogarty, a proud graduate of New York City Public Schools, and I'm speaking to you on behalf of Bridging Education and Art Together an arts nonprofit and registered DOE vendor that provides arts programming to New York City's youth and people with disabilities. 
Since our founding in 2009, we've impacted 2,000 students, most of whom come from under-resourced communities, and nearly half of our participants have a physical and or cognitive disability. I urge you to recognize what New York State education law has clearly stated for years, that arts education is essential and it must be adequately funded. Engagement in the arts is critical to youth development. The collaboration necessary for art making builds foundational life skills such as critical thinking, problem solving, teamwork, and empathy. Even before the COVID crisis, schools and organizations serving people with disabilities and under-resourced youth um, could not fund arts programs adequately. What's worse is that recent supports reports from the Washington Post and the New York Times indicate that students with disabilities are losing social and academic skills they acquired before school closures began. This skill loss will only continue if arts education remains underfunded. In March, we lost every school partnership that we had, not because of dimming interest from the schools, but because of budget cuts and mandated spending freezes from the DOE. Nonetheless, we pivoted our instruction to virtual platforms and struck new partnerships with disability service organizations who brought our programs to 700 participants this year. But we're here today on behalf of the hundreds of New York City youth in schools that need our programming but lost access in March. Now is your opportunity to ensure that the city's public schools can finally contribute to the holistic development of our youth through art. We owe it to our students. I'm Thank inspired. you to everyone on the Committee for Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations for your time. Thank you, uh, uh, Lulu, and to everyone on the panel. Um, and uh, uh, it's devastating testimony, uh, Lulu, and to hear that uh, all of those contracts um, uh, you know, were, were severed and, and all of the uh, funding was was cut. Um, you know, we we have to, as a city and as a society, come to a place of better understanding about the value of uh, this, um, uh, so that even in a pandemic, even in a crisis, uh, this isn't something that is seen as um, uh, something we can do without. And um, and the long term consequences of the actions that this administration and this Department of Education have taken will be felt for a long time to come, as you indicate, right? That uh, it is almost impossible in some cases to make up for the time that is being lost uh, and the, the the programming that is being lost and the uh, enrichment that's being lost um, and the engagement that's being lost, particularly um, for some uh, children. Um, and uh, Kimberly, thank you for uh, all the work that you do and the recommendations that you always bring um, uh, to this. And we will be obviously talking with the chancellor and, uh, and the administration about um, all of these things. Um, uh, Asari and Angeline, um, there are so many things going on in Ridgewood that are exciting um, and uh, this is, uh, yet another one. Um, uh, my husband and I watched a program uh, uh, that benefited the Ridgewood Tenants Union a couple of Sundays ago, um, a comedy show and, and uh, some other things. And uh, I appreciate your work. And, and we absolutely should be doing all of the things that you talked about in terms of uh, interest-free loans, but but really grants, right? And and real direct um, support in addition to what we already do as a city and the, the permitting process um, that you mentioned, obviously we hope that open culture is the very beginning of a broader um, uh, open permitting system and outdoor performance um, program and uh, excited to start that, but um, appreciate the work that you're doing uh, in, in and around Ridgewood and uh, and all of you uh, for what what uh, you're doing and fighting for. Obviously, uh, I, <laughs> I agree and uh, we need to um, continue this fight and and uh, right some of the wrongs that happened in this most recent budget um, and and get 
the Department of Education to a better place uh, in understanding the value of these programs. And, uh, and then of course the city budget needs to reflect that as well. Um, there should have been no cuts to CASA. Um, uh, I, I certainly forcefully fought that um, and uh, it, uh, it would have been much worse um, had, had we not fought back, but, um, but there were, should have been no cuts. So that's all I'll say to that and throw it back to our committee council. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, we're just checking quickly for council member questions. If there are any council members that have questions, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. Um, we are not seeing any questions, but before we move to the next panel, we also just wanted to remind everyone that you can submit written testimony up to 72 hours after the hearing. Um, so if there's anything that you'd like to add to your testimony, if um, you did not submit written testimony and would like to, or you did not submit testimony today, uh, please remember you can submit testimony to testimony at council.myc.gov through 72 hours after the start of the hearing. Um, so now we'll move to the next panel, which is panel six, and call the next four members. First, we have Jesse Lee, followed by Buzz Slutsky from the Leslie Lohman Museum of Art, followed by Kimada Legendre, I apologize again for any uh, pronunciation errors, and Adrian Benepe from the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. Um, Okay, if all members are signed on, uh, Jesse Lee, you may begin your testimony when the sergeant calls the clock. Thank you. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Jesse Lee. Uh, I am uh, a director of operation at Statement Art, a nonprofit in New York City providing a performing arts education, visual and performing arts education. Um, we have a, a, a after school and summer program, as well as a college a readiness program from a third grade to college students. And a lot of alums come back to us as well as they go through their college life and be, uh, get ready for their career. Um, one of the, we have been able to uh, transform ourselves, all our performing arts program in summer and the fall in virtual world. And, I don't know how we did it, but we did it. And um, the other thing that we uh, we have done uh, when we create the, this program this year, I, I call it created. It wasn't redoing it. It was a, literally recreate the program that we didn't have before that we spoke to a students and parents. We also uh, spoke to the teaching artists and school teachers that we partner with in throughout the New York City, constantly asking a question, what are the things that we need? What are the things that, that we, we didn't have before that emerged because of COVID-19? One of the issues that came up was about um, creating a sense of a community, creating a, a, a platform or space where the students in command just share their challenges and issues, their struggles. And, and those are the things that, that was a much needed and that turned it into our one of our program results, which, which is part of a design lab and studio where students can come and express their creativity and produce a, a performance or produce a video, anything like that. Um, so we're even able to do a virtual cabaret uh, in November. All of these are came from the students' feedbacks and their desire to be part of the a, a creative uh, projects and activities they're lacking. And, and one of the biggest things that we hear from the students are that they want a space in place they can actually work on these things that are interesting to them. They are able to use this a creativity, creativity projects and activities as an outlet of how to deal with their mental issues and social emotional issues and things like that. So one thing I like to say, instead of talking about our program more, one of the things I like to bring it up is that when um, there is a huge issue with the funding that we we are almost every month, there's a one or two funding. They Time either they are stop, stop uh, funding us or the reducing funding. The other thing that I like to bring it up is a couple of things we need. One uh, is, is a digital equity. Uh, one of the biggest challenge, again, uh, uh, many people said about it, the device issues uh, that, that they don't have a space. So they're literally working off of a bathroom sometimes and they have our internet access is another issue. The last issue that we like, we really need help is that if we can get more data and metrics, information that readily available as things are moving fast, those are the tools and resources that we often use to 
uh, to get more resources, more funding. So those are the another uh, last thing that we really need from from many different communities, uh, from especially from the city, if that's a possible, if that's something that can support. Thank you very much for the opportunity today. I'm really, really grateful for being able to be here and and just sharing what's going on on the ground with the students and parents and our teaching artists. Thank you so much. Our next panelist will be Buzz Slutsky from the Leslie Lohman Museum of Art. Hello, thank you to the I'm council for the to opportunity. Oh. Thank you to the council for the opportunity to present testimony in support of arts education. My name is Buzz Slutsky and I'm a teaching artist at the Leslie Lohman Museum of Art. Before the pandemic, the teaching artists of Leslie Lohman developed intersectional residency curricula and visited gender sexuality alliances of NYC public schools, sorry, middle schools and high schools. During our visits, we shared images and stories from queer art history, especially the AIDS movement and the Stonewall Rebellion, and created space for them to make art in those traditions in an effort to show youth that making art can be a way of fomenting liberation and change the conditions that affect queer people. The GSA visits helped students learn new identity words that they had never heard before. And it was powerful to watch youth transform from timid and scared of being found out to being proud, empowered, and opened up through feeling connected to history and community. As a non-binary and transgender person who never met a single out transgender person until adulthood, it's amazing to see how my mere presence can show youth that it's possible to be a self-actualized adult and artist and be a transgender and non-binary person. In March, once it was clear that it wasn't safe to work in schools, we had a difficult time reaching teachers that were GSA advisors who still had energy to work with us remotely on top of their grueling, the grueling nature of their online jobs. Because of parental homophobia and transphobia, it can be hard to connect directly with students, especially if they are not out. Our other ongoing work, such as providing museum tours and PD opportunities for teachers also became obsolete. Without continued sources of funding, it was impossible to strategize to find ways of working to connect with LGBTQ youth. The team of teaching artists decided to put our little last tiny bit of funding into creating a series of captioned videos in Spanish and English called Queer Art TV, in which we engage with works from the museum's collection and encourage viewers to make artwork in the spirit of these works, similar to what we would be doing with youth in the GSAs. While this was an exciting direction, it still doesn't reach youth to the extent that it did before the pandemic. Um, on September 15th, 25% of the museum staff was laid off, including a curator, an archivist, a senior staff member, and most of the staff members of color. In addition, the director of education was laid off in May. These cuts left a shell of the former staff to juggle multiple jobs. I fear that if the museum's educational program or programming or the museum itself fails to survive, a generation of students won't learn about their queer and trans ancestors like Marsha B. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera and won't see themselves reflected in art history and will miss out on experiences that could save their lives. Thank you for your consideration and support. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, the next panelist will be Kimada Legendra. I'm starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Van Bramer and members of the committee. My name is Kamada Leja and I am head of education for the Queens Museum. Thank you for your continued support of arts and culture during these difficult times. And thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Like many other members of the CIG, the operations of the Queens Museum were significantly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. After we shut our doors, we were faced with many challenges including programming to the public and meeting payroll. Despite this, we continue to offer essential programs and resources to advance and support public health, public life, and public benefit for our constituents. Despite significant, significant loss in revenue and steep cuts to programming, we were still able to move forward with a full suite of multilingual educational and cultural offerings, including our Queens Teens program, where teens have the opportunity to create art, discuss social justice, practice self-care, and attend various workshops and events. This group has now grown in size from 30 teens from Queens prior to the pandemic to 120 teens from across the five boroughs and Long Island since the pandemic. Participants created a stay-at-home guide featuring art making and self-care prompts. Most recently, our teens created a civic engagement guide 
to help both younger and older teens become active and involved in civics in their local communities. Our staff and teens regularly volunteer at the food pantry we started on site with La Jornada and Together We Can Community Resource Center, where we have served thousands of families since June. Queens Museum will continue to look at this recovery through the lens of arts and culture, as we strongly believe that a healthy cultural life will be an important part of the recovery and well being for our communities. Thank you to the committee for this opportunity to testify. Queens Museum looks forward to our partnership with the council and values your leadership through this crisis. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your testimony. The final witness on this panel will be Adrian Benefe from the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. You may begin your testimony when the sergeant calls the clock. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer and committee members, including I saw Majority Leader Cumbo, whose district encompasses the entire Brooklyn Botanic Garden. I'm Adrian Benabe, President and CEO of the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. BBG is a vital practitioner and proponent of informal inquiry-based science education. Our children's education programs invite both casual visitors and program participants to practice scientific skills and concepts for the exploration of plants. BBG's dozen plus education programs comprise a ladder of learning that engages participants of all ages in hands-on experiences that meaningfully connect them to the world of plants. More than 26,000 people were served this year so far. Although in-person programming was suspended for the spring and summer when we were closed for four months, we quickly pivoted to new and adapted virtual services, including e-newsletters with plant-based activities, center discovery and children's garden families, participation in WNET Group's CAP TV, a national public television series, online training in horticulture, cooking and science for our 50 garden apprentices, a Project Greenreach, that's our school program curriculum website featuring plant-based lesson plans and activities for K through eight teachers, inquiry-based professional development for teachers at the Brooklyn Academy for Science and Environment and participating in urban adventure schools and more. As with the New York Botanical Garden, our children's garden was turned into a farm. We provided more than 1,200 pounds of food for needy families in our communities. Our education team continues to develop and adapt programming for the schools, students, and teachers who depend on the garden's education and information services, and we have piloted virtual field trips this fall. Staff educators teach students live from the garden or their homes, meeting classes on their school's preferred preferred remote learning programs. In schools that opt for asynchronous programming, students watch videos filmed in the gardens, conservatories and greenhouses, which Time expired. Online, by the way, and follow BBG curriculum guides. The garden has focused on promoting virtual field trips to Title I schools via Project Greenreach and District 75. The education team has also worked to ensure our curriculum remains hands-on by mailing hundreds of science-based activity kits, including plants, to program par participants I wanna say how inspired I've been by hearing all the stories of my colleagues in this business facing the challenges and surmounting them. We remain committed and we appreciate the city council's steadfast support so that we can emerge whole and strong out of this pandemic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Chair. you very much. <clears throat> uh, always good uh, to see you, uh, Adrian, and, uh, uh, and good to hear that uh, uh, BBG, which obviously was able to welcome some folks uh, on site, um, you know, was also uh, going virtual and uh, uh, letting folks who couldn't or didn't feel comfortable or, or for whatever reason didn't have access uh, still able to uh, to partake in in the programs and and the grounds even. Um, virtually, which is so important. Um, and uh, Kamada, thank you. Uh, you. You know how much I love Queens uh, Museum and uh, was out there uh, with uh, all of you, uh, I guess a couple of months ago and saw some of that amazing work that you talked about and uh, the, the pantry and all of those young people. Um, you know, I, I could not have been more proud of, of the Queens Museum and what what uh, what I saw that day, um, and uh, uh, and I think um, 
I don't know if Buzz uh, is uh, still with us, but um, very much appreciate the testimony from uh, Leslie Lohman and um, was uh, uh, saddened to hear um, about uh, the, uh, the extent of the, the layoffs there, um, although obviously we're aware of layoffs at, uh, at, at most of our organizations and institutions, but, um, you know, also interested in the challenge and, and maybe you can unmute Buzz briefly because um, uh, as someone who identifies as queer, as a, a gay man, um, you know, the, and who was not out in high school, um, but uh, the, the, um, the work that you do um, in going into schools is terrific, of course, and, and meeting with GSAs and the advisors and, then, and the students. But uh, as you spoke, it occurred to me just how difficult that might be able to do online because the, uh, some of the young people who may not be out are, of course, sometimes safer in school uh, uh, in a group like a GSA with someone like yourself, um, you know, talking with them. But if they're on a, an iPhone or a, an iPad or a laptop in the house where they're not out, that could be incredibly challenging, right? Where, um, so, you know, um, what has that experience been like? And does that make your, your online work uh, even that more, much more challenging? Yeah, I also forgot to mention, um, I remember when you were speaking that initially we were starting to make what we were calling activity kits that were sort of like lesson plans that can be transmuted virtually. Um, I think it's just hard because we just don't have the, you know, the allies of the teachers available to us um, to the same extent that we did before the pandemic. But um, I think part of the issue is that if we don't have funding to continue to meet online, then it's hard to strategize of how to connect with students. But I think you're totally right that there's a lot of barriers for us to reach students. And um, I think we, we were starting to get excited about media that can be kind of sent out or maybe like some sort of web presence, things that youth can access um, without maybe parents hearing them speak out loud, something that they could do on headphones. Um, yeah, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, no, um, uh, and, and is, uh, yeah, so we should just stay in touch. I mean, obviously, you know, yeah. I, was, uh, uh, I care a lot about Leslie Lohman as I do uh, everyone, but uh, Thank you. Uh, program specifically uh, uh, working with uh, queer youth, you know, they're, they're few and far between. Um, and, uh, and so it's really important to uh, support them. And just because you mentioned uh, the name of Sylvia Rivera, um, yeah. one of the greatest nights of my life was uh, being in jail, uh, in a jail cell with Sylvia, Sylvia Rivera for 24 hours. Uh, wow. Because we were all arrested in um, March of 2000, trying to march in the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Uh, Amazing. Avenue, which at the time did not um, allow queer people to march with our banner. And uh, Sylvia Rivera and I were thrown into the same jail cell and spent the night um, uh, talking in a jail cell. Um, so. <laughs> Amazing story. Thank you for sharing that. It's, it is one of my uh, best activist stories um, before, <laughs> I, before I got elected to the city council. Um, so uh, thank you, uh, Buzz and Jesse uh, Lee, thank you very much um, uh, for your perspectives as well. Uh, thank you to this panel and I'll throw it back to our community council. Thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer and to the panel. Um, we'll just check for other council member questions before we move on. If there are council members that have questions, please use raise hand, the raise hand function. We're not seeing any, so we'll move to the next panel. The next four panelists, uh, panel seven will be Melissa Diaz, Heather Maxson, Mia Nagawicki, and Dominic Hood. So the next witness will be Melissa Diaz. You may begin once the sergeant calls the clock. Thank you. Starting time. Uh, 
um, we're just checking again for Melissa Diaz. She's there. Do you see her? Yeah, she. We. Uh, you might have to hit <laughs> accept and unmute. You actually have to accept it. I think we're. Um, I got it. There you go. <laughs> got it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm Melissa Diaz. Good afternoon, Chair Van Bramer and Committee Council. Um, I'm from the American Museum of Natural History, and I'd like to thank you for your unwavering support throughout the years, especially now as our cultural community faces the challenges of COVID-19. For cultural institutions like the Museum of Natural History, the closure of our building meant that within a matter of days, we had to make dramatic changes to how we operate and how we reach the public. It was a sudden halt for a place typically so full of students, families, life, and joy, but we remain focused on our mission of science education for all. I'd like to provide an update today about the Urban Advantage Program, which is the largest formalized middle school science education partnership program in New York City, as well as in the country. It was founded in 2004 with part in partnership with the city. And despite economic downturns and other emergencies, it has continuously evolved to meet the needs of teachers, students, and families in every council district, and it is still serving those communities today. We are in our 17th year, and it is a program that is designed to support the teaching and learning of science through a partnership with the council, the Department of Education, and eight of the city's science-based cultural institutions, including the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, the Bronx Zoo, the New York Aquarium, the New York Botanical Garden, the Hall of Science, the Queens Botanical Garden, and the Staten Island Zoo. We're all members of the Cultural Institutions Group, and we remain committed to public health, public service, and contributing positively to public life despite this tumultuous year. As school communities evolved to meet the needs of the new teaching and learning environment, so did Urban Advantage moving courses online in as little as one week and shifting our entire catalog online by mid-March. In a matter of days, we transformed the Urban Advantage model to serve hundreds of teachers remotely who count on the program for high quality professional development. As our doors closed, we continued reaching more than 46% of New York City public schools, providing intensive professional development for educators and administrators, inquiry promoting scientific materials and equipment, free access to partner institutions, and educational outreach to parents and administrators. Currently, we are serving over 63,000 middle school students and 700 middle school teachers, as well as 63,000 students, I'm sorry, 6,300 students in elementary schools. I'd like to thank you for supporting us and for all of us who collaborate on the Urban Advantage program. It is one way the council has continued supporting the teachers, parents, and students who have overcome these months of instability and since then, we have continued to offer vouchers to families who come to the museum on their own. I'd like to thank you all for your support for Urban Advantage over the years. And if you haven't yet, I encourage you to come and visit us. Thank you for your leadership. And of course, I welcome your questions. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll move to the next panelist and then accept questions after the panel. The next uh, witness will be Heather Maxson from the Whitney Museum of American Art. Starting Hi, everyone. Time. Hi, um, I'm Heather and I'm the Director of School Youth and Family Programs at the Whitney Museum. Thank you Chair Van Bramer and members of the committee for hosting us today. After the Whitney closed temporarily in March, we worked quickly to adapt, to adapt programs, collections and exhibitions to be available online and to ensure that while our doors were temporarily closed, the spirit of the Whitney remained open to all. With respect to our K-12 programming, we started offering free field trips for New York City public schools in 1983, a program that typically serves over 20,000 students a year. In response to teacher interest and need, in March, we pivoted quickly and began to offer free online field trips. Um, between last March and now, we've held more than 463 virtual classes for city schools, serving over 9,300 students from 169 schools. We expect many more and hope that many more requests come in the new year. We've also done a major outreach project identifying and reaching out to schools in the areas hardest hit by COVID. Um, one thing we're really proud of is that we have been able to keep our teaching artists who we call museum educators employed through this time. I have a testimony to share from Julie Ronios, a visual arts teacher at the Lower Manhattan Arts Academy, a school that has partnered with the Whitney since 2015. She says, 
How does one teach art making, let alone equitably, when kids don't have materials or space to make art? What I do know is that the Whitney's tossed me a life preserver. They got in touch and asked if I wanted to have some online field trips with my kids. I jumped at the opportunity. We meet every week online, hang out, and let art do what art does best, help us explain to ourselves the world we live in. We're also continuing to offer our successful after-school programs for New York City teenagers, um, art making classes, and artist talks, as well as free um, weekend programs for families. Um, and I just wanted to thank you so much. We're so grateful for the city's support of the cultural community and arts education during this difficult time. Thank you so much. The next panelist will be Mia Nagawicki. Thank you. Starting time. Hello, Chair Von Bramer and Committee on Cultural Affairs. I'm Mia Nagawicki, Vice President for Education at the New York Historical Society. Thank you for the opportunity to offer testimony today about how COVID-19 has affected the New York Historical Society and how our services have continued throughout this time. Uh, thanks in no small part to the vital support of the Department of Cultural Affairs and the City Council, so thank you. This has been a challenging year and we are continuing to feel the consequences of our temporary closure. Uh, attendance was expectedly low in fiscal year 2020 and the effect of income loss on our operating budget has been so severe, <clears throat> excuse me, that we have been forced to implement staff reductions and furloughs across every department. Despite these difficult setbacks, New York Historical has remained committed to its core mission of education. In response to school closures, we launched History at Home on March 23rd, turning our slate of K-12 programming into virtual offerings. Under History at Home, social studies enrichment lessons have been transformed into free weekly virtual sessions tailored to all grade levels. Museum-based field trips are now offered as virtual tours during which museum educators lead classes through our digital exhibits. Teens and teacher programs have moved online as well, quickly adapting to remote working sessions. Additionally, our flagship Academy for American Democracy program, which engages sixth grade classes in the history and evolution of democracy, has been converted to an online format with interactivity and art making. To further assist parents and teachers at home, New York Historical's robust curriculum guides are freely accessible online. Finally, our Demena Children's History Museum is providing engaging remote activities for young families as counterparts to curriculum-based learning. Together, these measures have allowed us to provide direct cultural education services to more than 61,000 teachers, students, and families since the pause began, and will continue until our in-person services can resume. In this time of fiscal uncertainty, we remain grateful for the city's investment in cultural education, and we thank you and your fellow city council members for your exceptional service. Thank you. Thank you so much. There's one more witness on this panel, and we'll move to that witness now. Dominique Hood from Historic Richmond Town. You may begin when the sergeant starts the clock. Starting time. Good afternoon, Chair Van Bramer and members of the committee. My name is Luke Boyd. I'm the Director of Education and Public Programs at Historic Richmond Town. I'm here to present Dominique Hood's uh, testimony on his behalf. He has since tested positive for coronavirus. My name is Dominique Hood and I'm an educator at Historic Richmond Town. Historic Richmond Town is a proud member of the city's cultural institutions group and the arts and cultural fabric of our great city. Throughout the COVID-19 crisis, CIGs have been committed to contributing to the city and to New Yorkers by supporting public life, public health, and public service. Since March, many of the everyday people whose lives we chronicle at Historic Richmond Town are visiting public have found solace and a breath of fresh air amongst our fields and forested areas along Richmond Creek. Though our site has remained open as a historic village park for passive visitation, in-person programs snarled to a halt. This change was no more evident than this past summer when historic Richmond Town's beloved apprentice program was canceled. For over eight decades, young people would experience the past in a profound way at our site, tasting bread made in the oven by their own hands, feeling the heat flowing off a hot iron as a blacksmith's hammer swung upon it smelling the fresh smell of wood cut by the carpenter. Out of caution and safety amidst the pandemic, this experiential program had been jettisoned. With hands-on learning as our dominant approach, how could we bring that authenticity to our public in a time of isolation and risk? In response, we launched a virtual apprenticeship program in which I was invited to play a part. I witnessed a young virtual apprentice build an intricate basket from a kit that we made and provided for them and by their own hand 
in their own home, guided by an educator on the other side of a screen. We witness nothing but joy and pride upon their face upon the completion of this project. This work we love can persist, can adapt, and can grow beyond this pandemic if only there are those who are willing to fight for it, investing in our cultural institutions during this time, fire. when arts and culture are needed most, will ensure that we will have the tools needed to expand necessary public engagement. <clears throat> in government and in the cultural sector, we share a common calling of service to our fellow citizens. I submit this testimony in the name of that service and implore the powers that be to provide it with the resources it requires and deserves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luke. Um, uh, I have been in that woodworking uh, shop a couple of years ago with uh, uh, Councilmember Matteo um, and uh, uh, appreciate uh, your testimony uh, and uh, uh, Mia, Heather and Melissa uh, you know, big fans of all of the work uh, and the institutions that you represent and um, are grateful that you're able to do as much as you are currently able to do on behalf of the people of the city of New York, particularly the children. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer. Uh, we do not have any other council member questions for this panel. So we will move to the next panel. The members of the next panel or panel eight will be Ali Abate, um, and again, please excuse any pronunciation errors, Paula Heitman, David Lawson, and David Shukoff. So the next witness will be Ali Abate. Abate. Um, you may begin when the sergeant calls the clock. Thank you so much. Starting time. Good morning, my name is Ali Abadi. I wanna thank Councilmember Van Bramer and the Department of Cultural Affairs for this opportunity and their ongoing support. Um, I'm the Director of Education at the Queens County Farm Museum. And I'd like to share with you how Queens Farm impacts our city and how we've been affected and have been adapting to the ongoing COVID-19 crisis. Uh, Queens Farm is one of the longest continuously farmed sites in New York State with a 323 year legacy of growing food in New York City. We're a 47 acre historic site and urban farm. We pride ourselves as a site that is open daily and free to the public for 354 days of a typical year. Pre-COVID, we serve over 400,000 visitors annually through school field trips, public events, and daily visitorship. And in a non-COVID year, over 100,000 of those visitors are students who participate in our acclaimed School to Farm Education Program. These students come from every New York City Council District in the Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan, and Queens. And often their visit to Queens Farm is their first visit to a working farm. Queens Farm serves 54% of Queens Elementary Schools that serve NYCHA communities, 51% in Manhattan, 40% in Brooklyn, and 36% in the Bronx. Um, the deepest impacts to our organization due to the pandemic are felt by the loss of our in-person education. Over 106,000 students were not able to visit us this year. That's based on previous year's attendance, and we were on track to head in that direction had we not closed. 113 program dates have been lost since the start of COVID and those are days when field trips would have taken place. Over 400 hours of educational time are lost and we've suffered staff reductions totaling 61% of our staff that have been unemployed due to the loss of programs. Uh, revenue loss from the loss of these programs totals about a uh, million dollars. These numbers represent a huge loss for our city, lost enrichment opportunities for students, teachers, and parents, and lost opportunities for outdoor learning in a unique environment that supports classroom learning, child development, and connection to nature, and promotes healthy eating and well-being. They also represent a massive loss for our dedicated staff of educators who benefit from and sustain themselves as professionals in arts and culture from this programming and who are suffering the financial burdens of lost employment. Um, what we've done in response has been a combination of virtual programming and a much reduced amount of in-person programming. We've created virtual learning through social media that we began as early as March 23rd and had over 200,000 impressions while the farm was closed to the public. We created remote curriculum support for teachers through resource guides and converted curriculum that they could use. We've done synchronous and asynchronous virtual tours for schools and provided outdoor experiences for the programs that could travel to us once we reopened as of August 2nd. We've maintained our CASA connections um, by preparing virtual opportunities and at-home off-screen activities for students and are getting ready for our CASA partnerships that'll be starting up this year. 
And one of the biggest impacts I think we had during the entire pandemic was a farm camp that we were able to offer in partnership with Common Point Queens this summer for seven weeks of programming for small pods of students that provided hands-on farm activities. And we saw through these programs, the power of farm education and how grateful our students and families that participated were for this program. Thank you for this opportunity and your time. Uh, we look to the council to help us in bridging these losses during this time of continued uncertainty. And as we work to heal and move forward towards a hopeful, hopefully healthier and brighter future. Thank you for your testimony. Our next uh, panelist will be Paula Heitman from Marquis Studio. You may begin once the sergeant starts the clock. Starting time. Good morning. My name is Paula Heitman. I am the executive director of Marquis Studios, a nonprofit arts education organization that has been providing arts programming to New York City public schools and all five boroughs for over 40 years. Thank you to the committee for holding this hearing today. I appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of Marquis Studios, its staff, teaching artists, the students and teachers we serve. I would also like to take this opportunity to amplify our gratitude for the support from city council via the CASA program. We are able to provide high quality arts programming to dozens of schools because of this support and we thank you. As many have stated before me, the impact of COVID-19 on our organization has been tremendous. Were it not for the relief aid, which we received through the Federal CARES Act, it is likely that we would not be here today. The funding we received from the Payroll Protection Act allowed us to keep the majority of our staff and teaching artists working while we shifted our programming to online, which was a monumental task that none of us were prepared for or had training or experience to do, but as creative people, we found a way. Our goal and our mission throughout last spring, the summer and this fall was to find a way. That is our motto, find a way. The question was never if we would be able to provide arts programming to our schools, but how we would provide arts programming to our schools. It has not been easy. In fact, it's been quite painful. As in order to manage our budget in a way that would allow us to stay committed to our schools, we had to make hard decisions about our staffing and our teaching artist rosters. We had to furlough many people and lay off some as well. And the biggest reason for this is cash flow issues. Last spring, we were not able to predict when or if we would receive payment for programming we delivered remotely. School budgets were in fact frozen, city funds were delayed, and yet we found a way as we believe deeply that the arts are essential. In closing, I would like to share a statement from the principal of one of our partnership schools, Chris Retta, principal of PS10X, a District 75 school and a CASA recipient. Chris says, for our students participating in remote learning, access to materials in the home has been limited exposing the inequities that our students and their families face. All children should have the ability to express themselves while being provided the tools and support to do so. The arts is a substantial force in the growth for every student. Children with special needs can realize that they too have a place in society, in their homes and in their communities to express themselves to the best of their individualized ability. I thank the committee Councilmember Van Bramer for providing this opportunity to hear from arts organizations across New York City. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next panelist will be David Lawson from the League of Independent Theaters. Starting time. Thank you to the committee for the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is David Lawson. I'm here to testify today as a member of the League of Independent Theater and as an arts educator. The League is an advocacy organizer for those who work in small theaters or non-traditional spaces. Like myself, many arts educators also work in creating professional theater. The abrupt shutdown of the theaters, professional performances, and classes hit us from all sides. 
For the past few years, I have been independently teaching classes where students write and perform their own one-person shows. Many of my students have gone on to perform their work at theaters, comedy clubs, and universities all around New York City and across the nation. Many arts educators like myself rely on renting rehearsal studios to provide our classes. Earlier this year, Simple Studios, the rehearsal space where I would teach my students, closed after over a decade in business. Simple Studios was by no means struggling before the pandemic. Every time I was there, it was packed full of arts education classes and professionals rehearsing productions. And it's not just Simple Studios, Shetler Studios, Champion Studios, Chelsea Studios, and Spaceworks were all rehearsal spaces that have permanently closed each one serving thousands of artists and educators. These spaces are closing because commercial rents have been out of control for years. That's why I am asking on behalf of community arts educators like myself and so many other great folks who have spoken today for city council to pass introduction 1796, which would create a commercial rent stabilization board to ensure that rehearsal spaces and theaters have a future in this city. I call upon the members of this committee to co-sponsor introduction 1796 and call for a hearing now. Thank you all so much. Thank you for your testimony. The final member of this panel will be David Shukoff from the Manhattan Theater Club. Starting Thank time. You. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, I'm David, or good afternoon. I'm David Shukoff, Director of Education Manhattan Theater Club calling from the historic lands of the Lenape Muncie, Pe Muncie peoples. Thank you, Chairman Van Bramer and committee members for this opportunity. Founded in 1989, MTC Education was the first education program created by a major theater company in New York City. Um, since then, we have been providing programs, uh, uh, robust programs in, to high schools in all five boroughs, combining classroom instruction and playwriting residencies with attendance at plays in our theaters. We have focused in particular on students in alternative schools, including detained and incarcerated youth on Rikers Island at Passages Academy and elsewhere. With the shutdown last March, MTC education pivoted to remote formats, just two of many examples our student monologue challenge invited students to submit one minute monologues, some of which we published on our website. Stargate Theater, our summer theater company for young men with a history of justice system involvement went digital, culminating in an original video play that received more than 15,000 views. Our school partnerships are now all remote. Teaching artists visit classrooms virtually and in lieu of matinees, our work centers on videos of past MTC productions. To be sure, we have encountered substantial cutbacks and challenges, among them navigating the switches between hybrid and all remote attendance, and crucially echoing other witnesses, insecure or non-existent internet access for significant numbers of students, especially those from under-resourced communities and in detention centers. Nonetheless, we have successfully completed several residencies and will continue to do so throughout the year. I am, however, concerned about the prospect of severe budget cuts which will impair schools ability to meet even the modest, highly subsidized fees we charge, which we have reduced this year to help out our partner schools. I'm expired. I, ur I urge the city council to make arts access in schools more equitable and ensure that funding is not affected disproportionately by the inevitable general budget cuts. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, David. Uh, they don't have to be inevitable, um, and uh, hopefully we can uh, successfully uh, fight them uh, back um, and uh, envision a different way to do budgets in the city of New York, as I alluded to earlier. Um, and uh, uh, to David Lawson and, and, and Lit, um, boy, have I been on the phone a lot with Lit uh, leadership over the last couple of weeks, which I appreciate. And we have a long relationship uh, and I uh, am a big supporter of commercial rent uh, control and uh, uh, also the Small Business Job Survival Act. Both of those uh, bills uh, should move and would help uh, our, our community an awful lot. 
um, uh, and uh, very painful uh, to to. I mean, I know these things uh, because I am of this world and and I'm in this space with all of you so much. But when David, you talk about those rehearsal spaces that are closing, and Paula, you're uh, talking about the the staff losses at uh, Marquis and the uh, just very very deeply painful. But I'm grateful that you continue that. And uh, uh, we love the Queens County Farm Museum, of course, um, and and uh, the programs that go on there. And uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ali, for uh, your work. And and just lastly, uh, uh, David uh, Shukov um, just talked about uh, programs and um, virtual programs for those who are incarcerated at this moment. And I just wanna thank you for uh, raising that and mentioning that we've talked about a lot of different communities that are being served a lot of underserved communities and uh, programs and services uh, for those who are incarcerated are very important. Um, and uh, our libraries, I'm chair of cultural affairs and libraries. Libraries do a lot of work um, uh, in uh, and for those who are uh, incarcerated, very important that uh, arts programming reach those communities as well. So thank you all. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer. We have no other council member questions, so we'll move to the next panel. Um, I will read the four names of panelists, um, followed by individual witness names. The next panel will be, or panel nine, Becky Leifman, Katie Corner, Nancy Cleaver, and Carlotta Santana. The next witness, the first member of that panel is Becky Leifman from Collab Theater Group. You may begin when the sergeant calls the clock. Starting time. Hi, my name is Becky Leafman and I'm the executive director of Collab Theater Group, a nonprofit that offers individuals with developmental disabilities a creative and social outlet through theater arts. We recognize that this city is in crisis and we're grateful to have the time to speak with you today. Collab, like so many arts organizations, transitioned our in-person classes from a rehearsal studio to Zoom classrooms. We are happy to report that we've maintained the majority of our participants, teens and adults with developmental disabilities. Much of this success is due to the flexibility of funders, such as the Department of Cultural Affairs, who allowed for grantees like Colab to reallocate performance costs toward digital programs. These past nine months, we've seen huge inequities in our participants. Some have access to high quality technology and some freeze through a class with unreliable internet. We've seen many of our partner organizations, day hab centers, schools, nonprofits struggle as they reallocate their arts funding to COVID precautions. Unfortunately, many have not been able to partner with us this season due to financial strain. We've listened to our participants share their grief as family and friends are passing away and sharing their anxieties around vaccine progress and distribution. On a positive note, we've seen our roster of 22 teaching artists brilliantly reimagine what it means to be an arts educator. They brought compassion, innovation, and joy to our programs. After the age of 21, mandated creative and social services for people with developmental disabilities drops as they leave the school system. Please invest in the arts as you continue New York City's COVID-19 response. New Yorkers, like our participants, need it now as a creative and social outlet and will need a post-pandemic to process the grief, trauma, and rebuilding process. Our field is willing to help you think of creative solutions. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Um, our next witness is Kim Corner. Starting time. Hi, my name is Kati Kerner and I'm the Director of Education at Lincoln Center Theater. Thank you so much to Chair Van Bramer and the entire committee for the opportunity to testify today. So although Lincoln Center Theater is dark, our education programs are going strong. This year we will provide online theater education services to more than 2,800 students in 28 New York City public middle and high schools in 15 city council districts around the city. LCT is reaching students and teachers through a combination of pre-recorded and live online content. Um, the centerpiece of our efforts this fall, just as an example, is um, a website devoted to one of our productions, Dominique Morisot's Play Pipeline, 
about race and schools, uh, which is really supposed to be a one stop shop for students to watch a video of the show, access activities and contextual information about issues re uh, related to school segregation and also serve as a springboard for our teaching artists to follow up to co create bespoke work for each participating class. So the key is really maximum flexibility. Each of our school partners has its own schedule, its own balance of live and pre-recorded content, its own challenges with attendance and student access to the internet and to technology. Serving uh, English as a new language students, recent immigrant students is a core part of LCT's education work. Our partner schools are gravely concerned about language loss among ENL students and see the arts as a key way to encourage those students to show up online and to speak up in class. So like with all teaching right now, uh, the job of a teaching artist has changed completely. It now requires more planning time, time to film and edit lessons and put them online, respond to student work and learn the necessary skills to teach effectively online. And with that, with those uh, added demands come frankly added costs for cultural organizations. The city Prime council fire. can support arts education through its continued advocacy and oversight. And thank you so much again to uh, the chair and the, the council for um, this and this committee for your leadership on this important issue. Thank you so much for your testimony. Our next panelist will be Nancy Cleaver from Dancing Classrooms. Starting time. Uh, good afternoon, council member Van Bramer and committee members. Um, my name is Nancy Cleaver, zooming in from Woodside, Queens, on the land of the Munsee, Lenape, and Canarsie peoples. I am the executive director for Dancing Classrooms, a 26-year-old organization that cultivates life skills in young people through the art and practice of social dance. We are, to my knowledge, the only nonprofit solely dedicated to teaching social and partner dances from around the world to children in New York City. In 2019, pre-COVID, we were on track to serve 150 schools across every borough and almost 17,000 New York City public school students. When the pandemic hit, as all of my colleagues have been saying, we pivoted almost immediately, producing free dance experiences for our teachers and bringing um, our weekend programs to Zoom. Thanks to emergency funding from amazing sources like New York Community Trust, um, and individual donors and our incredible teaching artists, we were able to translate our intensive dance residency for fourth through eighth graders into a remote learning offering called Dancing Classrooms Homeroom Edition and pilot it with longtime school partners for free. Uh, 11 schools and 33 classrooms uh, representing all five boroughs invited us to offer homeroom edition. And what we found was extraordinary. Not only can children learn social and partner dances over video, they can focus, they can collaborate, reflect on their feelings, show real progress towards the social emotional learning and dance learning goals we have for our in-person work as well. Like most of our peer organizations, we are not just a vendor or a program. We become part of the school family and part of their identity. This makes our role even more critical now, I believe. When children are experiencing such loss and all the routines are out of whack, we, the arts community, can be a beacon of hope, something familiar and exciting to look forward to. So this fall, in addition to Honing Homeroom Edition, we've created fully synchronous, hybrid and versions of our residencies. We offer free dance classes for educators. We're partnering with city council members through CASA and CII funding and community-based organizations to bring our programs to the after-school spaces. In a normal year, we would be working with 50 schools, but right now um, we are projecting to work with 20 and even reaching one-fifth of our services this year is proving to be a Herculean task. Um, I will have to submit the rest of, of my written testimony, but, um, but basically, you know, I implore our city council and the Department of Education to do what you can to really ensure that everyone at the Department of Education understands that arts, arts instruction must continue as a part of every child's academic program. It's not a frill. It's not, it's not something nice to do. It's a New York State mandate. That has not changed because of the pandemic. It's only become more urgent. Thank you so much for your leadership. Um, we're here, waiting in the wings, ready to leap into action. Um, please help us help them. Thank you so much. The final member of this panel will be Carlotta Santana. You may begin when the sergeant calls the clock. Thank you. Starting time. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Carlota Santana, and I'm the director of a company called Flamenco Vivo, a multicultural dance and music and Hispanic company. What I do want to say more than anything is that I prepared my little two-minute two speech a while ago, a couple of days ago, and now that listening to everyone, I just want to say ditto and thank you for everybody else's very, very powerful statements. I would like to just tell you a little bit about our company and say ditto to everybody else's, I'm, I'm repeating myself, powerful statement. So we are a company 35 years old. We've been doing arts and education for 35 years. We are a mixture of gypsy, Latino, Arabic, Latino, African cultures. We take all those cultures into the classroom and teach kids about culture, about pride and about discipline. In a usual year, we reach about 20,000 students, K through 12. This year, and starting at COVID, we went virtual. I have a bunch of teaching artists that surprised me how quickly they got into the virtual teaching. And we're in schools right now, and we're just with support of the DCA, starting some schools in the Bronx uh, to do our virtual teaching. Um, Thank you to everyone. Thank you to the whole committee and everybody I've heard today. I see my time is running out. Uh, we've had a lot of good support from the city, from the state, from NEA, and thank you to everyone. Ole. <laughs> <laughs> thank you uh, very much, uh, Carlotta. Um, and I agree that uh, collectively, this is a very powerful statement, right, uh, to have uh, dozens and dozens, this, this is our ninth panel, I think, and we're going on to the 10th panel. Um, uh, dozens and dozens of people and organizations um, and artists who uh, care so much about this and, uh, and who are against all odds are continuing to provide uh, as many services as they can to children uh, who desperately need them. Um, Nancy, thank you very much um, for your work. Um, always great uh, to see you and uh, the organization that you now lead and uh, Kati, I don't know if she's still here, but uh, thank you. Um, uh, of course, sad to hear uh, anyone say, you know, Lincoln Center, the stages are dark, um, but, uh, but certainly glad to hear that uh, education programs continue and uh, um, and, uh, and that goes for any stage that's dark in the city of New York right now. It's just uh, uh, devastating. Um, and Becky, thank you as well. I think Becky's still there, yeah. Um, and uh, appreciate everything uh, that all of you have had to say. And um, it's, it's kind of you, Carlotta, to say that we're, the, the city, state, and federal governments have done a lot. Uh, we can do more and we should do more. Um, and, uh, and that's our job, right, is to keep fighting for this community who has continued fighting through this unbearable time, uh, including drastic reductions in, in uh, support. So thank you all for continuing your work. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer. Um, we do not have any council member questions, so we'll move to the next panel. The next four members of the panel will be a panel 10, Flannery Gregg, Jerome or Jerry Corman, Carly Eckhart, and Judith Insel. Mr. Gregg, Flannery Gregg, um, you are the next witness and you may begin when the Sergeant calls the clock. Thank you. Starting time. Thank you to the committee for having me. My name is Flannery Gregg and I'm an associate choreographer on Broadway and the rehearsal director for Monica Bill Barnes and Company, a small dance company based in the city. Through the dance company, I've had the opportunity to work with the Hunter College Dance Department. In 2019, 16 Hunter students performed with us at the Fall for Dance Festival at City Center and they nailed it. It was the largest stage the students had ever performed on. Since the pandemic hit, the students and I adapted our craft for the online world by developing a virtual show called Keep Moving. Our choreography was layered with audio of the students describing challenges, how they continue to dance in their families' living rooms or in their basements next to the washing machine. Without any housing or financial support, many students have had to move away from the five boroughs. Some students are working on the front lines at their supplemental jobs. The only thing keeping us together are opportunities to continue working together. Currently, I only qualify for the minimum amount of unemployment, $184 a week. 
I have to rely on teaching opportunities as a source of sustainability to stay and live in New York. The dance company has been able to pay the students and myself for our time. Small dance companies and freelancers urgently need access to long-term funding from the city to support connections between students and professionals. This is crucial for students to grow and artists to sustain. While the open culture program will allow shows to go on in New York City streets, dancers will still need safe and supportive outdoor spaces to rehearse, such as weatherproof venues with proper flooring. A more sustainable option for us is going to be virtual. Small dance organizations and freelancers need affordable access to digital tools and platforms to promote and perform online. If NYC can build sustainable virtual performing arts platforms, artists and audiences are not limited by geography. We need free internet for all New Yorkers so dance students and audiences, regardless of their socioeconomic backgrounds, can attend virtual classes and performances. My Broadway gig was put on pause in March, but I have been able to teach emerging performing artists. The city as we know it will not exist I'm if, art if artists and students continue to be sidelined in COVID-19 recovery. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your testimony and I apologize um, also for the name. Uh, so the next panelist will be Jerome Corman. Uh, Starting time. You can hear me? Yep, we can hear you. We can hear you. Uh, first of all, I just want to say what an honor it is to be in this esteemed company. Thank you very, very much. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jerry Corman. I'm the music director at National Dance Institute, also known as NDI, headquartered in Harlem. In 1976, ballet star Jacques D'Amboise founded NDI in the belief that the arts have a unique power to engage and motivate individuals towards excellence. Ever since, NDI has transformed the lives of more than 2 million children. First, let me say, in this time of crisis, NDI is here, standing with New York City, standing with our school partners, standing with our young dancers. Partnering with our schools has never been more complicated, but it has never been more necessary. Across the board, the principals in our schools have told us that the students need music and dance. They need all the arts, more than ever. Sadly, due to scheduling and school finances, NDI is not presently serving all of our usual 42 schools, which has significantly impacted our organization, our teaching artists, and most importantly, the students. Arts education is essential, essential. Dance is an important language on its own, but dance through NDI, always accompanied with live music, even in the Zoom paradigm, also supports the social and emotional well-being of our students. NDI has a role to play in the schools right now, and we are continuing our work through a lens that puts racial equity and social justice front and center through training, hard conversations, and implementation. If 2020 has taught us anything, it is that New York City needs access, to, uh, needs to access its heart and soul so we see each other as equal and catch those that fall through the cracks. The arts are the perfect vehicle to support this work. Whatever the city needs to do to help support arts education and keep the arts alive, it is time to act. What will the consequences be if children do not have access to arts education during this time of crisis, when the ability to express thought is more important than ever? If New York City allows the gap of inequity to widen so that only children of financial means have access to learning in and through the arts, and personal development, empathy, exuberance, emotional engagement, and healing that only the arts can provide. What does this mean for our future? I just want to say once again, thank you very much for the opportunity. NDI is alive, but struggling. And um, we look forward to serving our schools uh, as much and uh, as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. The next panelist will be Carly Eckert. Starting time. <clears throat> Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Van Bramer and members of the Cultural Committee for hearing my testimony today as a representative of Dance Parade. My name is Carly Eckert and I'm the Community Engagement Director for Dance Parade. My responsibilities are to coordinate year-round dance education outreach in schools and community centers across the boroughs, which culminate in the annual dance parade on Broadway and festival in Tompkins Square Park. 
Although the 14th annual parade and festival were preempted last May due to COVID, we did manage to launch an interactive festival, which was attended by more than 6,500 people. Attendance was considered good for an online event. However, we believe that live performance in the streets and public parks is vital to awakening the communal human spirit and helps build a more equitable and vibrant society. After halting programming that began in February, a portion of our weekly dance residencies transitioned online and we were offered uh, and were offered free for students April through September, including residencies taught in Mandarin, launched under an award from Create NYC Language Access Fund. We had to bear considerable expense to get Zoom working, acclimate our teaching artists to remote teaching platforms, and overcome access and ch technical challenges for our students. We applied for several emergency grants from private foundations, received some financial assistance for three of our 15 teaching artists, but failed to receive support for the organization. We also applied for PPP, but as our organization is facilitated by mostly independent contractors, we were not eligible. We did, however, get a 30-year, 75,000 SBA loan and have spent down half of it. This fall, we have had to suspend online classes due to financial hardship, but we'll resume in February with DCLA CDF programs and hopefully CASA and SUCASA residencies as well. We are currently planning both a live event and virtual event as it is not clear whether a live parade and festival will be possible on May 22nd. Either I'm way, fire. our 2021 theme will be Dance Brings Us Together. Through our continued efforts and experiences of this time, we greatly acknowledge the health risks to all New Yorkers, pledge to continue strict virus-free safety protocols, and are grateful to the DCLA and for the council members' effort to support the cultural sector. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. The last member of the group will be Judith Insel from Bronx Art Ensemble. Starting time. Chair Van Bramer, honorable members of the city council, thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Judith Nitzel and I am the artistic director of the Bronx Arts Ensemble. Pre-pandemic, Bronx Arts Ensemble provided contracted services to 40 plus NYC Department of Education schools annually in the Bronx, presenting culturally responsive arts education in four arts disciplines of music, dance, theater, visual arts, to upwards of 5,000 primarily BIPOC Bronx students and employing 60 to 80 primarily BIPOC professional teaching artists. This past spring, BAE successfully modified its curriculum, making it possible to present students with more than 25 courses online. Currently, we are only serving six public schools. This has required BAE to terminate the services of approximately 80% of our teaching artist staff and puts our entire arts education program in jeopardy of shutting down in the coming spring school semester. Our current status is a result of the deep budgetary cuts that the DOE has imposed on what it had deemed in the spring to be the non-essential service of arts education. Bronx Arts Ensemble urgently asked the City Council to aid the DOE, normally a willing partner, in restoring the budgetary funds needed to re-engage thousands of public school students with the previously employed thousands of professional teaching artists system-wide. We know that our currently unemployed teaching artists and our former students are suffering and we also know that there is, if there is to be a future for culturally diverse art making in New York City, we need to ensure that our most underserved populations of black and brown students have access to arts education. And on a personal note, I would like to add, I would not be the professional musician that I am today if it were not due to public school access to arts education. Thank you again for allowing me to present my statement today. Uh, Judith, thank you very much um, for your testimony and for that story uh, and reminder of how important this is. Um, and uh, to all the panelists um, as well and, uh, and uh, this forwarded to me, I know uh, Gothamist is up with a story since this uh, hearing started. Obviously, they had been in the works uh, for a while, but uh, about uh, 
New York City's 4,500 teaching artists having been uh, incredibly hard hit by uh, the DOE cuts of uh, $21.5 million um, towards education. So just devastating um, uh, to all of us. Uh, but I thank you for your uh, persistence and uh, hope that that dance parade can happen um, in May. But if not, it will uh, it will uh, take place again. Um, and uh, with that, I, I just want to say thank you. And I hope folks, uh, uh, it's great to see so many dance. I just wanted to say also, there's so many dancers and so many dance uh, artists and um, organizations that are part of this today. And um, uh, uh, and I'm really thrilled uh, to see all of you here. Um, and uh, uh, thank everyone for for their testimony of being part of this community. And I know we have uh, one more panel. Is that what I'm told? That's correct, Chair. One more. Great. We let's uh, the five who are uh, last. Um, Thank you for waiting, uh, all of you, thank you for waiting uh, so long to give your testimony, but um, I am here listening to every single one of you, no matter who winds up being the last of the 50 or so people to testify today. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, so we will call the final panel, and just a reminder that we will do a sweep at the end. If we have inadvertently missed anyone, um, don't worry. We will check, and there will be an opportunity to testify if we didn't call your name. Um, also a reminder that you can submit written testimony, and we'll give that address again after this panel. So the final panel will be Again, I'll read all the names and then uh, each individual witness. Uh, Sydney Dr. Dance Grant, Andrew Reutstein, Laura Gravino, Andrew Chapman, and Julia Foreman. So the next witness will be Sydney Dr. Dance Grant, and you may begin when the sergeant calls the clock. Thank you. Time starts now. Okay. Uh, good, good afternoon, uh, Chair Van Bramer, esteemed committee, and glitter lovers everywhere. I'm Sydney Dr. Dance Grant, Executive and Artistic Director of Ballroom Basics USA, and no stranger to the City Council, having spoken at a variety of council and borough testimonies with our students actually performing our dances and the manners that make the movement matter so much. We are so proud to say that we're a vivid example of the funding success that you've all fought so hard for. Our FY20 CASA funding award from council member and now Queensborough President Donovan Richards enabled us to create one of the very first outdoor dance events in NYC our powerful parody, the Mock Corona Reina on Rockaway Beach. Council Member Moya, if you're still here, your generous CII funding enables us to do the same in Queens at the end of June, where willing students and parents from three partner schools in your district came together with masks and gloves to dance the Mock Corona Reina in Corona Park. It was literally the first time they saw one another since the crisis began in March, and many said it was the highlight of their school year. Council Member Borelli, we were proud to have extended an invite to you in your office this past August for our social distance dancing in La Tourette Park. And in September, we were the first arts organization in New York to engage on site in Staten Island on the very first day of school in your colleague Debbie Rose's neighboring district. She attended our special event, showed everyone how Shaolin does it, and actually posted a YouTube Macarona challenge to the speaker, Corey Johnson, who I had the good fortune of dancing with exactly one year ago this week at our organization's performance with students whose work was so generously awarded discretionary funding from council member Danique Miller, whose holiday toy fair we were thrilled to participate in. And Commissioner Casals, even though you're not here, you'd be proud to learn that in addition to swing and merengue, the students performed a dazzling tango argentino. I've met with Principal, Jani, uh, excuse me, with Council Member Janai's office for CASA funding. Time expired. And, and Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, we had a chance meeting in the elevator in the hallway at 250 Broadway. So you all know how much, how passionate we are about the education and etiquette ballroom Latin and line dance provide New York City school children. In closing, I would like to thank Mr. Van Bramer once again for continuing to fight so hard for arts funding. He brought up Pew Research about how edu educational outcomes are enhanced when children have arts education experiences to complement their learning. It bears mentioning that COVID-19 has statistically increased depression, 
isolation, and even, sadly, abuse. Therefore, I wholeheartedly agree with you, sir, that we must provide these vital arts opportunities to uplift and inspire kids. And I hope that you and your colleagues will recognize that FY22 funding is so critical to making that happen. Because energized, entertaining arts education is always a worthwhile investment for the future. Thank you so much. Sydney, we have met many times, you have testified many times, and I was kind of wondering if your, your next level energy and excitement was going to actually come through on Zoom, and I am happy to report that it did. Um, well, I so, thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, almost four hours into the hearing, um, uh, you, you brought it, so thank you for never, <laughs> ever disappointing. My pleasure, sir. Thank you so much. Our next panelist will be Andrew Roystein. You may get the sergeant calls the clock. Time starts now. Hi, everyone. It's great to see you all here and uh, great to see so many uh, community collaborators as well. Um, thank you, Chair Van Bremer and Bre members of New York City Council for your continued support and for this forum. Um, I'm Director of Education and Community Engagement at the Orchestra of St. Luke's, which provides free educational concert series each year and runs the Youth Orchestra of St. Luke's, which is also known as YOSL. YOSL is an after-school program that partners with public schools in the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood to offer free instrumental music lessons. Before the pandemic, we had 140 students enrolled at PS 111 in Manhattan, uh, PS 51, and PS 212 and Police Athletic League. YOSL has continued to offer online music lessons to our returning music students. And one parent's email says, it means the world that you are continuing to provide caring, excellent instruction for Liam and for the other YOSL students at this time. Having his cello here and being able to continue with, um, with some sense of normalcy is soothing. Normalcy is a word that we're hearing a lot um, from a lot of our parents and our kids uh, you know, for, throughout the last eight months. Um, while we've been able to focus on retaining our students from previous years to enhance their self-expression and creativity through music, we are aware of the many younger students throughout the city who are not yet able to start an instrument at this time due to the public health crisis that we currently face. The OSL thrives on our partnerships with performing arts teachers at each school, and it, this year it's clear that they need more support. Um, the time that the time that public school music teachers dedicate to helping programs like YOSL recruit new students and follow through on the well-being of our current students is currently very limited. Um, with former support, with further support for arts programs in schools, we will again be able to work more closely with our public school partners as they begin, as we all begin to rebuild the next creative generation. Um, that's all I have for today, but thank you all so much for your consideration and continued support. Thank you. Our next panelist will be Laura Gravino. Time starts now. Good afternoon, and thank you for providing this opportunity to present Bloomingdale School of Music's impact of COVID-19. My name is Laura Gravino, and I am the Director of Education at Bloomingdale School of Music, located by the Columbia University campus, serving the Upper West Side community since 1964. We serve students ages eight weeks to 80 years old, reaching well over 1,000 constituents on an annual basis through music opportunities. And last year we awarded $236,000 in financial aid and scholarships. In March, 2020, we made the decision that we would follow the DOE's lead and close our physical doors. We quickly focused on our faculty members to find out if they were ready and able to teach online. Many of them who'd lost other income through performance work stepped up to use their own equipment to teach lessons. We reached out to our students to confirm that they would continue lessons and classes with us. We shifted our partnership work to online platforms to keep continuity for students both in school and adults in retirement. We were able to retain 88% of our student population in spring 2020 and 62% for fall 2020. The work that went into transitioning to online learning was difficult, but it was an important step to keep a sense of normalcy for our community at large. The arts and cultural education sector is facing unprecedented challenges, and Bloomingdale is no exception. The COVID-19 health crisis has forced numerous cancellations, but has made clear the extent to which organizations like Bloomingdale School are an essential part of our community. But we are not receiving enough support from the city to sustain them in the medium or long terms. 
We need your support by advocating for the necessity of arts education during this pandemic. We need your support by providing our school leaders with the resources to continue working with arts partners. We need your support by restoring all of the arts education funding that has been cut. Support for organizations like ours in this trying time can help ensure that we continue to provide high level music education to our community, no matter the personal economic situation of our students. The arts and arts education community needs you right now so that we can be there for you in the years to come. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, our next panelist is Andrew Chapman, who is a second to last witness. Thank you. Time starts now. Thank you committee for this hearing. I work for Dance Education Laboratory, Dell. Our motto, dance for every child. Dell brings life-changing dance education to New York City public schools while supporting our students and our incomparable roster of expert teaching artists, offering them an array of professional development training workshops and employing freelance artists as workshop facilitators, myself included. Our DOE contract this year dropped from $260,000 to $35,000. A grant from the New York City Community Trust allowed Dell to continue programming virtually, albeit at less than half of our pre-COVID capacity. Not all arts ed programs are so lucky or as financially secured. Most of all, programs in New York City public schools. Of the $34 billion DOE budget for this year, a mere 0.04% has been allocated to bring quality arts education to 1.1 million students, 72.8% of whom are economically disadvantaged as defined by the city and will be hard pressed to gain extracurricular access to the arts. Personal stories have great impact on your committee and nothing feels more personal than the future of this city, a future assured by children raised with a financially sustainable arts education. Remember, arts education is not only about joy and mental health, it is about thinking outside the box and also knowing how to design the box, build the box, decorate the box, dance around the box and make that box a musical instrument. It is about interdisciplinary and transferable skills that these kids will have for the rest of their lives. Radical policy can secure post-COVID recovery and sustain this future for arts ed programming. I am calling on this committee to advocate for an arts education budget yearly standard of 0.25% of the DOE budget. This quarter of a percent overall budget initiative will hire more arts faculty, provide essential resources for school programming and help support organizations like Dell and the organizations here today in our ongoing mission to bring the arts to every child in New York City. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our final member of the panel and final witness before we check for anyone we've, we've inadvertently missed will be Julia Foreman. Uh, Julia Foreman, you may begin your testimony when the sergeant calls the clock. Thank you. Time starts now. I thank everyone so much uh, for being here and, and to the committee and to council member Van Bramer for uh, holding this hearing. Um, I don't wanna echo too much of what people have said before me because I think Andrew just put that beautifully. Um, I am a artist admirer and uh, a city council candidate for the 2021 election. Um, but I am actually here wearing a hat of a community organizer and someone who's been deeply involved in our local mutual aid groups um, in Western Queens. One thing that I've seen is that people are able to think so far outside the box to find solutions to these brand new problems that we're facing during COVID. Um, I think council member Van Bramer did that when he uh, proposed open culture and we'll see that starting in March, but there are so many other ways that we can take the lead of the community organizers who have been figuring out ways to solve problems this entire pandemic. Uh, for one, I believe that we've been hearing from each and every person testifying at how much a student's mental health is impacted by their ability to express themselves creativity, create, creative, creatively, sorry. Because of that, I think that we need to explore opportunities of funding that go outside the Department of Cultural Affairs, that go outside the Department of Education. Look at things like the Department of Health, look at things like agencies that have shut down and they have a supplies budget that is not being used because everyone's working from home and use that money to get students the resources that they need so that they can participate in each of the amazing programs that we've heard described today. Um, I think that this is a critical point. I think that we owe a lot to our students who have lost 
out on many opportunities who are struggling just as much as every adult, if not more. And I implore this committee to be the leader, to lead the council and this administration into that creative thinking and figuring out ways that we can invest in our students, invest in our children, and look at any way that we can, you know, dig between the couch cushions of our city agencies to find money to help them. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's our final witness. Um, Chair Van Bramer, do you have any questions for the panel? Uh, do you want to make a, a sweep of the uh, room, so to speak, and then uh, I will uh, address the panel and give my closing remarks? Will do. Thank you so much, Chair. So at this point, uh, per the chair, as the chair mentioned, we have concluded public testimony and all of the panelists. However, if we have inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify and is logged into Zoom now, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call on you in the order that your hand is raised. So if we have inadvertently missed anyone, please raise your hand in Zoom using the raise hand function. So if you if you uh, see anything, you'll let me know. Uh, uh, Brenda, <laughs> so until then, I'll, I'll start addressing the panel. Uh, Julia, thank you uh, so very much. And um, uh, uh, as, as, as you know, um, the committee staff uh, randomly chooses the order. Certainly a constituent of my district um, is uh, uh, very, very important to me as, uh, as was Nancy Cleaver and several other uh, uh, constituents who were part of this hearing today. Uh, so I thank you for uh, waiting uh, and uh, we, we saved uh, the best for last. Um, but I appreciate your ideas. I do agree with you that the mutual aid movement and, and really uh, community-led responses to the pandemic uh, teach us a lot about what is possible um, beyond uh, the traditional government uh, venues. Um, government will still be important uh, uh, and uh, government funding will, will still need to be there for the arts, but I agree with you that there are uh, other ways in which to support the arts. And I appreciate your thinking about these issues uh, thoughtfully and, and constructively and, and caring about uh, this, uh, this issue and this community. Um, and uh, Andrew, I think this is the first time uh, uh, I can remember um, at least you speaking before the committee. Um, you had a lot of really great ideas. I appreciate the, uh, the budget analysis and the suggestion about uh, what the baseline should be. Um, uh, I also uh, appreciate that you finished right at the zero mark. Uh, it was almost as if you were a performer and an artist and knew uh, your mark. Um, and Andrew, thank you. Uh, as well, uh, it's a great organization that uh, you represented today, uh, and I think, um, and I think uh, our other uh, panelist has already gone, but I praised his energy and excitement uh, earlier. Um, so I want to thank everyone uh, for being here. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, um, this is a topic that uh, deserves uh, as much attention as as possible and uh, this committee has remained uh, very active and very focused during the pandemic, uh, pursuing uh, not only uh, a budget that uh, we could, um, that we could appreciate uh, in terms of the arts uh, and uh, minimizing the damage uh, that, uh, that uh, Others may have uh, uh, thought necessary, but uh, we absolutely need to sustain and increase budgets. But we also need uh, creative legislative solutions uh, like open culture and several other bills that we have in the pipeline. But then we also need to think outside the box, uh, the boxes. Uh, Andrew, to quote you, you were doing sort of the whole box thing going on there um, with, uh, uh, outside of the boxes of the traditional budget structure and even the traditional legislative structure to address this community's dire needs, right? Uh, few communities have been devastated 
uh, like the arts, like artists, like culture, um, and uh, in very unique ways, um, and and uh, in a very vulnerable place. Um, the arts and culture are always underappreciated, but particularly during crises, uh, when people think, you know, that's a luxury in good times and bad times. We can do without that. Um, and this committee and my uh, work is all about fighting that back and uh, and letting people know that this is as important as ever. Um, and of course, just to end it where we began it, right? The children of New York City's public schools, um, uh, most of whom are black and brown, um, many of whom are immigrants or the children of immigrants, um, uh, many of whom uh, come from families that don't have a lot of money, desperately deserve and need arts in their lives and arts as a part of their education. And that is our collective work. So um, this hearing was helpful, uh, instructive and enlightening. And now we continue the work of making sure that the entire city of New York appreciates what we all talked about here today and move on some of the suggestions. So with that, thank you. And uh, unless the committee counsel, Brenda McKinney, thank you for being here with us for almost four hours. Um, I will uh, call this uh, committee hearing adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>